Well, this is, uh, I guess, maybe just to be expected. I don't know why, but uh, I can guess. The smallest group I've ever had uh, to start out any lecture with in the last two semesters of Zoom classes. Uh, I might hazard a guess that some people are on chat rooms discussing the Derek Chauvin trial verdict or some other topics related to that. Or otherwise, working on your papers, if those people who aren't here are doing that, then good for them. But they're going to miss something really, uh, maybe the most famous part of this course in terms of painting and the, um, <laughs> yeah, right, uh, which is Impressionism. Because Impressionist paintings, of course, were a major, in fact, the word revolution isn't too strong uh, in uh, the field of painting a major development or, or a break with the past. And this movement, of course, produced now some of the most famous painters in the history of the world, but their influence then, of course, spread all around the world and is still being felt today. I, I doubt uh, most of you know, don't, let me put it this way, I would be surprised if any of you don't know at least one person who has done some classes, uh, studied or, you know, practiced painting on their own or formally with, you know, a, a teacher or, or in a class that hasn't studied Impressionism as a technique. So we're going to explain what is and what isn't Impressionism. We're going to talk about some of the most famous paintings and painters uh, of the last 200 years, and we'll cut one or two slides and still try to end early, okay? Um, I'm, I'm assuming or hoping we'll get a few more people joining us. In any case, let me do one thing here. That's for whoever watches th this as a video uh, before your papers are due. I've done this like twice, I think, since the second paper I've been mentioning. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, good. Welcome. We're just starting with a little uh, sort of house cleaning quick reminder. I think everyone now is aware your papers are due one week from tonight. I give you guys a break until as long as they're in before midnight on the date they're due, they aren't counted late and no points off. If it's uh, after midnight, the day after they're due until six days later, it's only five points off. And after that, it's 10 points off. Okay, so remember, this is the format that you need to use, uh, which is uh, of course, this is 1.2 or 1.2 short paper number two. Don't mislabel it number one, or I'll think you're just resubmitting an earlier paper. Uh, of course, number two, I crossed out. You see there, of course, underlined last name, comma, first name, and send it as a PDF file to only please to my mark w at aol.com email address because it's much easier to navigate especially now that there's all these uh, you know, commentaries and, and, and uh, new directives. And of course, things like you know, this co college's decision, the administration decision not to hold in-person lecture classes in the fall, the responses to that and to the social justice issues and the, you know, various other things that are happening. Of course, uh, it's all you know, relevant. I mean, most of it, I do get some some uh, spam too on the Outlook website, but the spam filter and the functional uh, aspect of, believe it or not, AOL as old as it is, for me, it's easier to navigate and it is for my readers. So please stick to that, you know, for any extra credit in any, now for questions, you know, about your uh, grades or anything else in the class, that's okay to send through Outlook or queries. Like, uh, I think it was Luis, you sent a question, I, I answered it as soon as I saw it about what's okay to use for research. That kind of thing through Outlook is fine. I check both websites every day, except, uh, well, on weekends, I might not do it on a Saturday or until Sunday night. You know, I would check Friday night, not again till Sunday night. So if you want responses quickly, you should send them to either uh, email address or both as a backup. But for your papers and all other extra credit or any other kind of graded uh, assignments or, or projects or whatever you submissions, I should say, all all those have to be PH, uh, sorry PhD. Some of you will get a PhD. Have to be, of course, um, 
a PDF format properly labeled and only sent to my AOL. Okay, any questions before we get started with tonight's lecture? Because we have some really interesting images that I'll bet many of you have seen and, and wondered what makes them impressionistic. But first, we're all going to cover English realism, which talk about social justice issues. That's what that movement was all about. That's just the first few slides. We'll do that and then go right into impressionism. And we'll probably take a break around the regular time. About 8.30, it's still in early. Or I'm at 8. Sorry, 8, since we started at 6. Any questions before we get started about your grades, your papers, extra credit, or anything relating to the class? Anybody? All right. Again, I'll stick around afterwards when we get to the end at the last slide and, and answer any other questions there may be. Okay, so we're going to start with the first must know right off the bat. There really isn't any need to uh, uh, do, do any kind of uh, context here because the definitions are coming up. Uh, and let's see, I want to hide this thumbnail. Oh, yeah, that's right. Just push this up to the side. Okay, let's get this larger. And just want to make sure you guys can see it. Okay. You guys can see this. All right, this is the first must know tonight. And it's the last of England is the title. The last of England, just like it sounds. The artist's name, last name was Brown. And the date is 1855. So let's define English realism. There's only two definitions tonight. By the way, I could have said this, so I might as well now. As some people assume that Van Gogh was an impressionist and they have seen books, documentaries, videos, they keep miscategorizing him as an impressionist. He dabbled briefly as a you know beginning student of painting. Uh, well, not right at the beginning, but early on in his career, uh, a little bit. He did a few impressionist paintings, but that's not, he wasn't part of the movement and that wasn't the style he developed. You will get to him next week. That's a part of post-impressionism. Uh, but certainly without knowing what impression is, it's harder to understand how Van Gogh was even more uh, innovative and creative, some would say out there <laughs> in his style, uh, than even these people tonight who were already revolutionary enough. Okay, so what is the definition? Uh, let's see. All right, here we go. Welcome. We're just getting started. So again, this is Brown, The Last of England, 1855. Let's do that first definition which is uh, English realism. Okay, here it is. It's a movement of painting in England from circa 1840 to 1900. So yeah, it's a long time, right? That's the whole latter part of the, it's basically the Victorian era, right? So I'll say it again. It's a movement of painting in England from circa 1840 to 1900, comma, in which painters uh, portrayed um, the right phrase now, I want to use it exactly correctly so it's easy for you to recall and, and uh, remember, uh, pure transcripts from nature. I'll say it again, in which artists, plural of course, portrayed pure transcripts from nature meaning super realistic. Of course, the title tells you that. You see that as you're looking at, before we even get to the meaning of this in just a moment. Okay, what the second half of that definition is equally important though. Both of tonight's definitions have two sentences. Sorry about that. But if you didn't have both, you, you, you wouldn't be able to see how they fit the movements. Okay, so what's the second second? Sorry, uh, sentence, I'll, I'll be okay. Second sentence of uh, English realism. Okay, it is, uh, uh, they did this in order, these artists, you could say, these artists did this in order to cure the ills of society. That's an actual quote from their manifesto. Yeah, they had a manifesto, they were that organized. I'll say the whole thing again one more time. English realism was a movement of English painting from circa 1840 to 1900, comma, in which artists sought to portray and it's a quote, pure transcripts from nature, period, second sentence. They did this in order to, again, quote, cure the ills of society, unquote. Wow, what a bunch of egotistical 
you know, self-important people. They thought painting could help cure any of the ills of British society. Yes, they did. And in some cases we've seen, remember last week, uh, I hope everyone's seen that lecture by now, even if you didn't attend the live portion, uh, you definitely want to, because that whole thing of romanticism, at least one of those paintings will be on the final, as tonight at least one, probably two of these will be on the final. Uh, so, so with romanticism, we saw several paintings like the slave ship that really helped change the course of the debates over whatever social issue in that case, it was slavery, of course, in the British Empire. So yeah, art can have that much of an impact. And this one did. Okay, so what does the title tell us? Here's the, uh, all the facts you should know about the meaning. Well, obviously, this is a couple, a young couple, we can even tell that they are new parents, right? Look at the little babies. The first few times I showed this slide, I didn't even notice that. Little tiny fingers of their newborn, nearly just say infant or baby. Uh, the mother is clutching, of course, uh, and uh, they are on the deck of a boat, and the title tells us that they're doing something related to leaving. Well, yes, they're leaving the coast of England. Those are the White Cliffs of Dover. Some of you may know that that is a landmark. If you ever go across the English Channel, uh, well, of course, it'd be, well, how else would you do it by boat? Well, yeah, you can go under, you can do, take the channel by truck or bus, but most people take a boat. It's much more picturesque uh, and less expensive. From England to France or the other way around, you're going to see the white cliffs of Dover uh, pretty much unless you go all the way out towards Ireland and come through that way. So so the whole southern coast, where Mutt doesn't say most, but a lot of the southern coast of England had these white cliffs and they're called the white cliffs of Dover. And that's what we're seeing. So what does that tell us? They're leaving England. The title tells us that now also the painting. Why is the main point of the meaning? Why are they leaving England? Okay, and where are they going? Now, anybody want to hazard a guess about either of those two? There's no absolute right or wrong here because the, the painter did not explain the painting, you know, like, um, uh, you know, some painters did, you know, when they had their painting on display or they wrote about their work. He didn't explain it, but uh, he did later on by letter. We know what he intended. So they're heading somewhere for a vacation in France, you think? No, <laughs> much more serious than that. Look at their expression on their faces, both their faces. Uh, they are heading away from their homeland. They're leaving their birthplace, England, uh, forever. When it says the last, that's implying they're not going to ever see England again. So where anybody has a guess, I'm sure some of you have, a couple of you already thought about it. Where, where would they be going in this period of history if some couple, a young couple, a young family is leaving England on a boat, never coming back again, where might they be going? U.S.? Yep, that's the most likely target. Let's just say the new world is what the uh, uh, artist said, but yeah, you, you got the main point. Yeah, probably most likely America. It could be Canada, and of course it could even be possibly even further away. It could be Australia or New Zealand, but it's most likely the, yeah, the United States. In any case, let's assume that, which is a reasonable assumption, because millions of people from the British Isles and then later on, of course, all over Europe and eventually Asia and of course Africa uh, and Latin America did come to America during this period. But at this early stage, 1850s, we're talking about you know early Victorian times, the, the majority of the people coming to the United States were coming from Great Britain or you know England, Scotland, Wales, right? So that's what they're probably doing. Why would they be doing that? Well, I think some of you know this, but since we want to you know keep moving along and in early, I'll go ahead and just put it out there. They are probably escaping either poverty, hunger, uh, lack of freedom, one of, or all three. And if they were poor or working class, they look the way they're dressed, like they're not, you know, homeless or anything, but they're certainly not wealthy. Look at all the other people on the boat. This is not a pleasure cruise or a vacation. Uh, these people are emigrating away from their homeland to a new life in a new country where almost certainly they've never been before. And that takes what quality for as some of you know from your own personal experiences, according to the many bios that I read of the backgrounds that people wrote about their own backgrounds, 
Uh, what what quality would you say it takes to do what they're doing? Well, I'm sure some of you have a thought. <laughs> um, foolishness, a, a nature, a gambling nature, mm, something more basic than that. Okay, all right. It should be pretty clear. If it's not, you should write this. Courage, it takes courage. And you might think, well, then what's the artist's big deal with this view? He's just showing a phenomena that was going on constantly, you know, all through each year for year after year. It had already been happening since oh, early 1800s, English immigrants left their homeland and came to America. Well, there is a message and here it is. The social ill that this is addressing is the prejudice and bias against English citizens who left their homeland, I'll repeat this because this is the main part of the meaning, uh, to go to a new country. Believe it or not, they were called cowards, traitors, turncoats, all kinds of insults by sometimes even ministers, but certainly a lot of the, the uh, newspapers and politicians and even some of their own neighbors called them all kinds of uh, nasty words. It sounds vaguely familiar only here you see it on the receiving end sometimes of, the, of those who arrive here. So again, I'll repeat that. What the social e ill or evil that the painter is trying to addre address is the discrimination and prejudice against English immigrants who left their own country to come to America because they were being called traitors and uh, you know disloyal and all kinds of so he's what's he saying in a nutshell the message in one line or one sentence of this painting is not only should we not disrespect or uh, be prejudiced against our fellow English citizens who choose to move to a new country and start a new life but we should honor their courage that's a Pretty powerful message. So guess what? This painting was reproduced by the millions all over the British Isles by people who had family members, you know, relatives who'd gone to America or hoped that they could later. And in this country, and not just the US, but Canada and all the other English speaking countries that, that uh, some of these immigrants went to, it was reproduced in P on, and put on the walls of some of these homes because people understood when they saw this that this was an artist saying these are these are courageous people. It takes courage to give up everything and everyone you've ever known. Remember, no social media. <laughs> You're lucky if you got one letter every you know three months or every six months from home, if they even could, could be sent at all. So if you went out to the uh, outer edges of frontiers in these places, you wouldn't get any mail. You'd never hear from some of the people you knew uh, when you were uh, growing up. So it takes courage. And that's what this artist is saying. We should honor that. Okay, one last fact. You, you could write this if you want. And it's not just because in my case, I did the research. Uh, my heritage is Irish and Scottish. I'm sure many of you have done it and know your own heritage from whatever ancestral background you came from. Uh, and of course, if you're indigenous or Native American, this wouldn't apply to you. But for all the rest of us, the vast majority, 99% of the population of the US, of course, this is, this is what our ancestors did, right? And so here's a fact that I'll bet you won't hear unless you take a course on uh, the history of you know immigration or something that covers that. Uh, between 1820, when the US government started keeping records on immigration and 1920, when the racist immigration laws were passed, restricting almost all immigration, for about 45 years until the 60s when they were opened up again. So for that one hundred exactly one century, right? 1820 to 1920. I would guess none of you could even come close to uh, knowing how many, but if you want to take a guess, by all means, please do. How many people came from all over the world? Now by the 1920s, they were coming not from England much anymore, but from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Can anybody guess how many total immigrants came to the US during that century? 100 million. That's an average of a million a year. And that's even counting for the period during the Civil War when there wasn't any immigration or World War I, when of course there wasn't any. So it averaged over a million people a year. And that's 
100 to almost 200 years ago that was going on. It's pretty important. No other country in the world has had that kind of phenomena. None. Okay. Formal analysis should be pretty easy because, of course, it's super realistic. So you're going to see realistic simulated textures everywhere on their clothing, their face, uh, this umbrella. Even that's a rope, you know, on the deck, uh, the, the deck, you can just see the deck of the boat. Uh, the uh, modeling is super sharp and realistic. You, you could use the phrase, if this is on the essay part of the final, uh, photorealism technique, because by now there were photos being taken by sometimes painters before they painted the scene. They would take a picture, a photo of it. So photorealism is really part of what you see here. And these people were harking back to the early Renaissance. So the other word for them, I should have mentioned this part of the meaning, is pre-Raphaelites. It's an odd, don't worry how to spell it, it's with an uh, R-A-P-H, like the artist Raphael, the uh, famous Italian Renaissance painter. So they called themselves, uh, the second term some, some of them chose to go by was a, as a group pre-Raphaelites, like that means they were going back to early Renaissance realism. And you can see that here, you know, like Van Eyck, right? The fact that was one of their inspirations. Okay, what about stable versus dynamic? It, it may look slightly dynamic because of this umbrella and her bonnet, but really they are sitting upright and their arms, her arms especially and shoulders are upright. Uh, even the way the, uh, the background is here, the, the cliffs in the background, most of the other passengers standing, it's mostly stable with some dynamic detail. Uh, there is, here are all the techniques for, for realism uh, in space are used, and that would be obviously overlapping, uh, foreshortening, you know, on, on their shoulders and, and the umbrella, and uh, uh, even on the cliffs, right? And then we definitely have a scientific perspective. There'd be a vanishing point back here. And there's, I'd say, atmospheric perspective, just some of it along the edges of the water anyway. So atmospheric perspective, scientific perspective, diminishing size, of course, on the deck, overlapping and foreshortening all use. All the lines are thin. The colors are mostly warm on their skin tones. And though this at first glance, in some views, it doesn't look as a kind of uh, light uh, grayish tan. So you could say that that's somewhat uh, cool, but it has brownish hues. You see that in the folds. So other than that, though, the clothing and their skin tones, faces, hands, it, it's all warm. The background, of course, is cool. The largest mass is the mother and then the father and then the umbrella. Uh, and it's obvious the rhythm is powerful with repeated uh, features of their faces, their heads, their arms. Um, OK. And is it balanced? Yes, it is. They're directly set in the middle of the painting. OK, uh, let's see. I may or may not have taken this off the list, but either way, uh, no, it's on the list. OK, it's a must know. Our second must know of English realism. And then we will uh, briefly touch on one more that's not on the syllabus just for your edification about uh, suicide. It's pretty powerful, but I, I took it off the list. But this is on the syllabus, so you need to take notes. Hunt the artist, last name Hunt. The title, The Awakening Conscience. And conscience, as you may uh, have guessed, is spelled C-O-N-S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Not the other word of con meaning of conscience. Uh, it's not someone waking up from a nap. It's much more powerful than that, much more meaningful. The Awakening Conscience, 1853. This is English realism, so that's part of the meaning, and I already defined that, so you don't need to you know, write all of that again, just to say this is an example, a very famous one. I'm picking some of the most famous ones by English realist artists that were used uh, as illustrations to make a point. Copies of these were made. By this time, they had color printing, right? Lithographs or things like that. And uh, there were copies of these paintings in people's homes. So what do we see here? Well, we see... Uh, uh, fairly well, I could you could just tell by this apartment if it's not obvious, it's his apartment. A wealthy English man or you know, uh, male who is gesturing in some way to a young woman who, well, look at her dress. I think it should be obvious she is not well off, she's working class and he's upper class, and the apartment is his apartment. And she's standing up and looking, let's look at her face more closely, where? Out the window. That's, of course, a mirror, obviously, <laughs> reflecting what she sees. She's seeing the sun, 
the light through the window. And she's getting up. It should be obvious from having just been sitting on his lap. So anybody want to, this again, there's no right or wrong here, but anybody want to take a, a guess as to what just happened or what is happening in this painting? Okay, <laughs> I guess you guys are tongue-tied tonight. It's a clear-cut case of a man with power and wealth abusing that to have an affair. He is married and he has his home somewhere else. And this is his mistress. It's probably a former nanny or maid from, you know, before when she worked in his home, who he decided, of course, to use his, you know, wealth to maneuver or manipulate, however you want to say that, into a, a carnal relationship. And she's getting up as though at the second we see in this painting, the very split second it depicts, she had an epiphany. You can write it however you want. Uh, you know, a sudden, you know, uh, awareness of the fact that she doesn't want this anymore. She's going to leave. This is something she shouldn't be doing. And she's about to go out of this, you know, sordid situation, this, uh, you know, obviously uh, undesirable scenario um, and go off on her own, even if it means she has to work, you know, who knows how many hours to support herself. She realizes the better choice is for me to be on my own and get away from this, this guy that is saying, you can tell by looking, what's the matter? Sit down, you know, where are you going? <laughs> of course, he's you know, not thinking at all about anything but himself. So it's a very powerful statement. And the uh, social ill, you could imagine, is the artist. By the way, these artists, these, these English realist painters were almost all upper class. And they almost all knew people that did things like they uh, depicted and that they felt were wrong. So they were trying to show that they felt they, not that they were morally superior, but that anyone with any sense of morality shouldn't be doing these kinds of things. For instance, here, the message is, as you should put it in your notes, that it's, uh, it's wrong. It's a social ill or evil, you could use either word, for upper class or wealthy British men to abuse their power over working class women and uh, pressure or force them into, uh, you know, affairs or becoming mistresses when it's not in their best interest. That's a pretty strong message because it was so common. You don't have to even just know any uh, English romantic, uh, sorry, I meant Victorian era novels or movies set during that period or have read books written in that period to know. It was a very common phenomenon, even perhaps more, more so than it has been since. Uh, because most upper class English people didn't think about the needs at this point in time of the working class and even much of the middle class or anyone with less wealth than they did. And these uh, artists were saying that's wrong, uh, abusing your, your power, your wealth to uh, take advantage of someone, uh, you know, less well off is, is, is wrong. And it's pretty strong here. When people look at this, they knew they would have known that that was the message. Okay, formal analysis. Again, this is super sharp realism. I think you get the idea why this movement was called English realism um, and not English social justice painting, even though that was the underlying purpose. The style is strictly realistic, much like early Renaissance paintings like Van Eyck's. You see really strong simulated textures and super sharp detailing on the dress, his clothing, their their faces, of course, their whole room around them. Uh, and then the modeling is also equally strong on every object, uh, the two uh, bodies, the two people, and all of the furniture around them. Uh, then we have her in the middle, so it's balanced because I would say he roughly balances the piano. Now, if you think, oh, well, there's a clock on top and his head's down here, then look in the mirror and you see uh, objects on the wall here and there. It's, it's roughly balanced with her almost directly in the center. And of course, she's the largest mass and then him and then the piano. They were singing a duet until she got sick and tired of it. Uh, and then we have stable, almost entirely stable. Uh, because, you know, she's only slightly leaning forward as she gets ready to take her first step out to the outside world and get away from him. And yet you could say, all right, the, uh, his upper body's leaning back. So there are dynamic details, of course, the, uh, not the clock itself, but the case it's in. 
the edge of the piano, but those are small details. Overall, this is almost entirely stable. The room is practically uh, totally uh, straight lines as is uh, most of the furniture and she's standing almost totally upright. There's um, the rhythm, of course, of the arms, hands, heads, and some of the patterns on the rug. And then my favorite detail, most people don't notice is this cat who might be saying, it looks like, yeah, go girl, <laughs> or you know, something silly like that in whatever feline way of expressing it. He, the cat probably isn't well treated either by this guy. I assume it could be her cat, but it's unlikely he probably owns that. Um, anyway, so we see uh, rhythm uh, even in the patterns on the, on the uh, carpet uh, and, and her rather poor shabby dress uh, that he, he's too cheap to even buy her a, a fancy dress. Okay, and then lines everywhere as they always are in English realist paintings are all thin. Then, and then we have uh, the space. Here we've got, I see atmospheric perspective. You look out, you see there across the street. It's obviously a wealthy neighborhood. If you guess what part of London, it's probably the new West End where all these rich men were keeping women like this. It was even, you know, there are whole books about that, right? Written at the time and ever and since. Uh, about that being a popular area for, um, you know, pads, what we call today for them, these wealthy men to maintain a, a, an apartment for their mistress. Uh, anyway, what's outside the window has atmospheric perspective. There's a, there's a vanishing point if you drew the line far enough. And then of course there's overlapping, foreshortening and diminishing size. So all the main techniques for space. Um, all right, let's move on to this. This is just gonna, I'm gonna skip this one even though I'll give you the time. Uh, hi, welcome. Welcome. We're just on the uh, second of the must know paintings of the English realism. Um, and I just gave the definition. Of course, you can get that. I'll repeat that if anybody wants me to, either of the two definitions at the end again, but not, not right now. Uh, okay, so what we're seeing here is another English realism page, not on your syllabus, so we can just quickly uh, mention the title. It's called Strayed Sheep or Our English Coasts. And the black sheep here are symbolic of Karl Marx. Oh yes, <laughs> that may seem bizarre to some of you. If you've studied the history of Karl Marx in the foundation or forming of communism, the Communist Manifesto, all that, he was in England. He lived most of his life. He was exiled from Germany where he would have been put in prison if he hadn't left for writing against the government there. But in England, he, there was some freedom of speech by the late 1800s. So when this painting was painted in 1860, Karl Marx was already writing his manifestos and trying to get the British working class to rise up against their masters. So that's what this is it's supposed to be, a warning against black sheep. In this case, we're talking about radical socialist agitators, quote unquote, of course, which is what they would have been called for sure, <laughs> and sometimes still are. Uh, you know, trying to get these sheep who are starving to leave what their owner and they already have, but now they have no food and water. And if they keep going, they're going to fall to their death over the cliff. That's what the, uh, you know, not so subtle message is here. But that's not on the syllabus. Neither is this next one, which is Ophelia. I love this one. This is 1850. Uh, six, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it is. You have to know it. It's not on the syllabus. It's a scene from Hamlet. I'll keep it brief because you want to get to the next must know. A scene from Hamlet in which one of the main characters, a woman named Ophelia, was in love with Hamlet that the play was named after. <coughs> Excuse me. And she committed suicide after he told her to get to a nunnery when she thought maybe he would marry her one day. She really just, you know, didn't didn't know how to handle that rejection. So she committed suicide by uh, dressing in a heavy flowered dress, meaning flowers on the dress, actual, you know, pounds and pounds of flowers she wrapped around herself, threw herself backwards into a stream and slowly sank below the water, drowning herself to death. What's the social evil in that, that this artist is addressing? It's John Everett Millay, by the way, is the name of the artist. He, actually, it's 1852, I remember now. He is saying that if you are one of the people who, like this character Ophelia, feel you know, the pain of rejection and uh, maybe even considering something drastic like suicide, which, by the way, there was a rash of suicides across uh, Europe, not just in England, during this period because of several books and novels and plays, not Hamlet, they've been around for centuries by that time, right? 
because Shakespeare was already hundreds of years earlier. But besides plays like Hamlet and other tragedies, he mostly wrote tragedies, of course, Romeo and Juliet. Um, he also, um, I mean, he, uh, the British and uh, other European populations had a, a high percentage of young people committing suicide uh, because of romantic tragedy or unrequited love, because they thought it was fashionable or romantic to do it. So what he's saying here is look closely and you see what happens if you, you know, give in to that, of course, which is sometimes a strong impulse, right? I mean, I think everyone at some point in your life has felt down enough to briefly think about it, hopefully briefly. And, and this artist is saying, don't do it. Wait a while, you'll feel better. And I can tell you, this painting had that effect on me, and I'll keep this to 60 seconds. Right after my first, you know, girlfriend relationship in college, uh, when she broke up with me, I was alone in the dorms for the Thanksgiving break. That's a pretty depressing time when you're the only person in the whole dormitory by yourself when everyone else went home to their family. So I read a book called The Sufferings of Young Werther by Goethe. And you probably, some of you know, Goethe was one of the great writers, German, of course, but translated into English. And all kinds of, of editions in English had been published, and many young people were reading that and jumping out of windows and killing themselves, some of them drowning themselves. So when I read that, I remember thinking, this is the right time to read this, because the character in that book, spoiler alert, shoots himself through the head after he's rejected by his girlfriend at the point where he thought she was going to agree to marry him. So it's a tragedy about suicide, but of course it wasn't meant to encourage it. So this painting is saying, think about it, don't do it. It's not worth it. All right, well now we're sh shifting gears to impressionism, which is the main topic for tonight. And I can guarantee you one of these uh, impressionist paintings, and I'll tell you which ones are not gonna be cut from the list. Oh, I meant to say, because a couple of just joined us. The first slide for tonight, so I'll just tell you now, and if you go back and watch the video, you can, if you weren't here when we started, Brown, The Last of England, I'm not cutting that from the study list. It's a very important slide. It has at least a 50-50 oh, chance of being on the final. Okay, th these next two slides are my own slides of the Musée d'Orsay. That is the Impressionist Museum in Paris. It was a former train station. I think you can tell by looking, it had been a train station in uh, 1900. Paris had a huge World's Fair. And uh, this was the main train station people took coming all over Europe into Paris to go to that fair. So for many decades, it was just a train station and it was empty, you know, just abandoned like some of these old buildings. And it was a woman architect actually, and I can't remember her name, it's a long French name, who converted it into the current museum. Uh, here's what you see if you go up on the roof. This is what I was doing when I took this. That's the Louvre, look how close they are. One foot bridge across the Seine, a walk, uh, literally a five minute walk and you can go from one museum to the other. But don't even try to see them both in one day. You can't even see either. Well, maybe you see the Museo de Orsay, most of the paintings there in one day, because it's a not that large museum, but the Louvre, you got to spend a couple of days. So I was just trying to set the setting, you know, to fix it in my memory and with photos I knew I'd be showing in this class, because after I was already teaching here. And I made a big mistake. It almost cost me a lot more than uh, a fine. I ignored a sign in French that I pretended I didn't understand. It was a, a chain across the bottom of a five-story stairwell in the back of the museum. And I knew it said something about passage interdict in French, but don't go here, stop, forbidden, off limits. I stepped over that because the chain was only, you know, like three feet above the, the uh, floor. Walked up to the top, saw this view, couldn't resist taking a photo, but as I stood where I was standing, I mean, as I took a step forward to get a, another view, you know, I'm going to get a closer that would show the, the river in front of the, the museums. I heard a cracking sound like that. And I looked down, I was standing on a skylight five stories above the floor. If I had walked one more step forward, I probably wouldn't have walked home. I probably would have lost both my legs. So yeah, there's a reason why some uh, foreign governments uh, warn people in their own language not to, to do certain things. Now we covered this slide, I think you'll remember, but please confirm if no one here tonight remembers it or most of you don't, I'll go ahead and give it a, the meaning again. Um, this one is, um, <clears throat> Right. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, my my. Let me take a quick, quick break, like ten seconds. Manet, luncheon on the grass. M A N E T. Manet. 
luncheon on the grass. It's not on the syllabus uh, because we already covered it the first uh, week of class in the introductory lecture. But here's what you should be writing now. Manet, the next uh, one of his uh, paintings is not only a must know, but so important that the odds are what, much greater than 50, 50 even, that it will be on the final. And that's this one, The Pfeiffer. Manet is M-A-N-E-T. I know many people have trouble separating the two artists. They are both Impressionists, both French, lived at the same time, knew each other, were friends, and are the two first Impressionist painters in history. So they're considered the founders of Impressionism. But one is Monet, we'll get to him at the end of this evening, with an O, of course, and Manet, this guy, with an A. So here we go. Here's what I'm going to say about Manet. It's all part of the meaning of the must-know, and that's the better image of it. Uh, Manet is considered the father of Impressionism. That's an actual quote by all the other Impressionists. They gave him that title. He didn't. He didn't say, oh, I'm the father of Impressionism. It wasn't egotistical or like that. But other painters at the time, other Impressionists, considered him to be their founder. Monet even said that, although Monet and Manet both were beginning to experiment in this new style. So let's define Impressionism. It's pretty important. This definition is almost certainly going to appear on the true-false section, right, of the uh, final. Here we go. And it's, it's a two-sentence definition. I'll say it slowly and repeat it once. Okay, Impressionism is a movement of French painting from circa 1860 to 1890, comma, a movement of French painting from circa 1860 to 1890, comma, in which artists created their own unique impressions of how light affects a scene. I'll repeat that sentence and then the second one. In which artists created their own unique impressions of how light affects, that's what the uh, scene, period. Second sentence, they did this with a technique called the color patch revolution. Again, they did this with a technique called the color patch revolution, period. Now, right now, that probably won't mean much to, to any of you, but it should before we even get to the break, because I'm going to explain that as we go through the next two or three slides of the first few Impressionists must know slides. Okay, so this is an example of a painting which is blended. It's not on the syllabus, but I just want you to see the difference here between the earlier realism that had dominated European painting since the Renaissance. The figures here, we talked about what the meaning is, so I'm not going to go into that again the first week of class, are the actual artists, Manet and Pissarro, one of his friends, one of the early Impressionists, and a woman who supported uh, them, not physically or financially, but, you know, culturally. She believed in Impressionism and she helped get their paintings into some of the galleries. They couldn't get them into the museums or the main galleries, but some of the more radical, uh, on, you know, avant-garde is the word, right? To be radical in French, avant-garde gallery. So, so they were all friends and it's, it's depicting a group and she wasn't nude on the day they took this painting. That's an afterthought. The point is the upper part of it, let's look at that, is what's impressionistic. Everything from the edge of the water practically up to the horizon. So most people think, oh, okay, now I get it. Impressionism just means fuzzy painting. Oh no, no, that, that's not only too simplistic, it was completely misleading. Because there had been fuzzier details, remember, all the way back to the 1600s uh, with the maids of honor, a couple of the, the details on the little girl, the spoiled little princess in the painting, in the middle of the painting, or even on um, Van Dyck's portraits and uh, Franz Hall's of the 1600s. Some of the clothing and, and the edges of their you know, collars and things were, were fuzzy and not sharp. So that is not the definition of impression. So let's go now to the must know and we'll see what is the distinguishing care or what are, I should say, what are the distinguishing characteristics of impressionism. First, let's say what this is. It's called the Pfeiffer. I already gave you the title, right? Uh, and the date 1866. Many, just say many historians consider this to, bur to be, sorry, the first fully Impressionist painting. Many historians consider it this one, this 
image to be the first, you could say truly or fully impressionist painting. We'll say why in just a few seconds. And so I like to write it this way. You don't have to, you can come up with another phrase if you prefer, but I like to put it this way that this little boy started a revolution without even realizing it. Of course, whoever posed for it, it was a portrait of a real person, had no idea how famous they would, their image, if not their name, that actually we know who it was, but it doesn't matter. It's totally irrelevant to have the name of somebody long forgotten. What's important is the image, the technique, the style of impressionism that is used here. So the, I like to say, I'll say that again. Uh, it's just my own phrase now, that this little boy started a revolution without even realizing it. How? Well, let's talk about what marks us as an impressionist painting first, or just say one of, because it's hard to prove the first. So just say one of the very first impressionist paintings is what we're looking at. Well, let's start with the fact that it, it abandons this painting and the style of impressionism itself. So you could say Monet led the way, Manet, M-A-N-E-T, to abandoning four of the nine elements of composition that were used since the Renaissance in realistic style painting. I'll say it again. This painting abandons, or in other words, doesn't use fully, you know, or clearly, four out of the nine, and you know what those nine elements are because you've all written, uh, hopefully now almost your second paper. So you know what I'm talking about. Four out of the nine elements is almost half of the techniques used for all the paintings since the European, of course, paintings since the Renaissance all the realistic paintings, and they were all realistic, all of them, you know, varying degrees. Until you get to romanticism, then there's a little bit of a breakdown. So what are those four things? This is the main facts you should have in your notes in case it's on the essay part of the final, that this does, this painting has that, that abandoned techniques uh, from uh, realistic style painting. Well, let's get up close. And we'll start with the fact that there is minimal modeling. You can't say none. So it just, and if this was super realistic, his face wouldn't look, this is what, uh, here we go. Welcome. Yeah, we're just getting started with impressionism just now. So if you want to know the definition, uh, I'll give it again at the end. And it's also on the video, of course, that you can watch on Friday or any time after Friday night. Okay, so let me start again. That what we're looking at is the boy's face, especially, but even his jacket and the upper part of his pants and his, uh, you know, hands to a certain degree, not this one, but the, 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 the inside, you know, the palm of his hand. So mostly we're looking at the parts of a painting where an artist, if he was doing realistic style and not impressionistic style portrait, you'd see all these details, super sharp simulated textures of the skin and the hair and the clothing. It's just patches of color. You see, that's where the definition I just gave you comes in. This is an example of using that new technique that Impressionists invented called the color patch revolutions. You've got patches of dark blue, patches of white, patches of red, patches of gray, patches of, you could say pink, I guess, or very, very light pink. It's almost like, you know, somebody that's, uh, not been in the sun for a while here. So it just, here's what the critics said of this. They hated it. They called it an insult to the public. Amateurish, these are quotes. You could, or if you want to write them as part of the meeting, because it was attacked by every critic with one or two exceptions in the entire Paris area when it was shown at a gallery, right? Uh, and, and he couldn't sell it. <laughs> it's worth tens of millions of dollars now, but he couldn't sell it. So they said it was flat as playing cards and an insult to the public because there's almost no modeling. It's limited to his hands and a little bit on the sash. His hat doesn't have any modeling. His jacket doesn't, his face, I mean, minimal, right? Just around the very outer edges. And that's more just the outline of his, or the, uh, no, not outline, I misspoke, uh, or the uh, uh, edges of his cheeks. So there is some modeling on the pants, okay? So from below the waist, there's some, but it's still, it's minimal modeling, okay? The next thing should be obvious to everyone already, just looking at it without having you know, done the formal analysis. There is no depiction of space, of realistic space here. He is not placed in any realistic setting. All we know is he's floating, all we can see of him in an undefined setting. He could be indoors, he could be outdoors, it could be nighttime, it could be daytime, he could be by himself, he could be in a crowd. We don't know. The artist doesn't give us a clue. 
And that's shocking. It would have been upsetting and radical to people. Why? That's why the, the movement, the entire group of artists that called themselves Impressionists, well, they didn't give themselves that name. Some, some critic did. But once they accepted that name and they did and adopted it, uh, they, they were basically saying that we're, we're revolutionaries. We're trying to break away from all the strict rules. 400 years they've been in place since the Renaissance uh, where everything has to be super sharp and realistic. So. There is no realistic depiction of space. I mean, it's true there's overlapping. Okay, yeah, but that's only on his own body. We don't know where he is. So he's not depicted in any realistic space. Uh, no techniques for space are used to set him in a real setting. That's uh, disturbing to most people who looked at this. They actually stood in front of it and, and hooted and hollered when people came to this gallery. Oh yeah, it was that upsetting to mainstream art uh, lovers and critics. Okay, and then the that's the second thing, right? The lack of any realistic setting of and, and, and with spa, any space techniques uh, other than overlapping on his body. Okay, and then we have the fact that there is only implied simulated texture. It isn't super sharp, obviously. You can see that from what we just looked at right before we started the impressionist section of tonight's lecture with those English realist paintings. It's implied. But really, there is no sharp, realistic cement texture anywhere on this. It's just implied. So we read into it that, oh, well, that must be cloth, and this must be metal, and there must be skin. But it is not. So there is no sharp or realistic cement texture. That's another Renaissance rule of realism that he abandoned. But the one that surprises most people, and occasionally I have students debate me over this, but look carefully, there is not a single line used as outline anywhere in this painting. That is a very strong point because that's maybe the most uncertain feature of it. When you glance at it until you start looking closely, it's all patches of color and sections like, for instance, on his hat, you can, whoops, sorry, I meant to get up close there. You can see that's a patch of yellow, that's a patch of red, that's a patch of dark blue. This is almost a solid patch here. And then smaller patches of gold, round ones, of course, for his buttons. Uh, th there is no line as outline here. Even on his pants, those are stripes that are part of the color patch composition. So I'll say it again. The four things that Impressionism, at least fully or truly Impressionist paintings, is starting with Monet and, well, you have to say also Monet, the earliest Impressionist paintings, that they abandoned the four things that truly Impressionist paintings did not use from Renaissance realism was um, realistic depiction of space, uh, line as outline, strong realistic modeling, and sharp realistic cement texture. Those are not present here. So this was a really radical painting. It got all kinds of uh, criticism and it almost ruined Manet's career and uh, actually his health. He actually took it so badly that he lost sleep over it and uh, his health declined, although he recovered. And by the time he died, he was recognized by all the other Impressionists as basically the father, they called him the father of Impressionism for that reason that he was the first one to go out there and take these leaps forward or however you want to say it, the, this, this new uh, technique and uh, be willing to take the criticism that came with it. Formal analysis, it's a single mass or is it? Oh, okay, you could break it down and say, all right, maybe the flute case is the second largest. You could do it that way. And then the flute and then the hat, I guess, would be the fourth. Uh, for space, the only technique is overlapping. His clothes overlap him and his fingers overlap the flute. And of course, there's a rhythm uh, that is with the two feet, the two hands, the two arms, the face, lots of rhythm. The colors warm on the pants and very minimally. I mean, it's almost cool, but just slightly into the pink hue uh, zone of the uh, warm. So it's somewhat warm on the hands and the face uh, and the flute case, but uh, his upper body, that jacket is dark blue as is most of the, well, the details on the hat are mixed. Uh, the, the hat itself, of course, is, is, is a dark blue like the jacket, that's a cool color. And a sash, uh, right? And I guess these are socks. <laughs> Uh, are white, so they're cool. Um, then it is stable. I know he's leaning slightly to uh, his right or our left, but really he's mostly standing upright. And so it's more stable than dynamic. 
Uh, and then we have uh, already mentioned the other techniques. We've covered them, you know, minimal modeling on the pants, mostly a little bit on the sash and hands. And then we have the, uh, of course, uh, implied, not any realistic or sharp simulated textures anywhere. Okay, and then no line is outlined. Okay. Now, you can rest your hands, pens, or recording devices. I, I told you guys, I don't mind you guys recording this on your own, but of course it's being recorded for future use, but uh, you should be taking notes. But this one's not a must know, so I'm giving you a break. I just thought it was so clearly classic example, such a clearly classic example of uh, impressionism that I, I would use it. I took this painting with this class in mind. I don't mean this very section, but teaching this same class anytime I was going to show impressionist slides and explain it. So it's, you don't have to write this, but just follow me here. Just, just do, do like a three minute overview of what we're looking at. It's a painting by Manet when he went to Italy. Most impressionists traveled all over Europe and painted different countries, not just England. I'm mean, sorry, but France, they were from France. So he'd gone to Italy and it's called Grand Canal Venice, 1875 is the year by Manet. You don't have to know it, but it is, it is a fascinating story behind it. But I'm just gonna talk about the technique of impressionism. So here's what happens. Let's say you're on the Grand Canal. If you ever get to Venice, hopefully you'll get to do that before the whole city sinks beneath the waves, but it is sinking, you know that. But anyway, most people manage to get, you know, a view of the Grand Canal. And let's say it's a hot summer day and you just had your queso and your Chianti and, you know, you're sleepy. So you, you sack out with your sleeping bag as your pillow, stretch your legs out towards facing the canal away from the foot traffic so you don't trip anyone and fall asleep and then wake up, you know, from completely sound sleep. And what would happen with your eyesight if you did that? Well, I've done that, exactly that. <laughs> Here's what you'd see. The first thing you'd notice is your eyes just start to focus is the sunlight dappling off the water. Look at those patches of color, look at them, right? And then the next thing you'd probably notice is the white or dark and light, you could just say, but they're mostly black and white patches of reflections from the gondola poles. Of course, that's what they are. That's where they hook up the gondolas when they uh, stop, you know, giving rides to people. So the gondola poles are reflected. There's patches of, of uh, white and black colors. Again, the color patch revolution. And then on the water, the boat itself creates patches. And then you probably notice the boat because it's the largest single object and it has black and gray, mostly dark gray and black. So it, that's of course the presence of all colors. You know that black is the presence of all colors mixed together. So uh, your eyes would notice that and they might even fix on it for a while. But the last thing you'd notice would be, I think I have another close-up of it. Yeah, would be the gondolier. Why? Because the patches of white and black on his vest and shirt blend in with the patches of white and black in the shadows of the windows on the white stucco houses across the canal. He would blend in with them for a few seconds until you finally focused your eyes. It's almost involuntary. So these, these were geniuses, these people, these impressionists, they were coming up with something that no one had thought of, let alone how to portray how our eyesight functions when we first look at a scene that the sun is shining on. Subconsciously, this is what we would notice. Assuming you have a course, you know, the full vision or like me, a good pair of glasses or you're not, uh, you don't have color impaired vision. Okay, so you don't have to write that, but this one now is a must know. Pretty famous, Ball, it's Renoir is the artist. I should always start with the artist's name, R-E-N-O-I-R, -R, Renoir. I'm sure you've all heard of him. Ball at the Moula de la Galette. Now I am sorry that that's such a long title, but it's such a famous painting. However, I want to give you a break, and I will say this one might or might not uh, be on the final study list, so you do need to take notes. The next one, the second Renoir, is one I absolutely will not cut from the study list for the final. So these two kind of both equally are important at this point, but uh, one of them is, is the, I'll say it when we get to it the next slide, uh, so important that I, I won't cut it for sure. This one may or may not. Okay, Renoir, Ball, I'll spell this, of course, these are French words. Ball at the Moulin, that's M-O-U, 
L-I-N. It's a French word, which means actually windmill or nightclub. It's come to mean both. It's a, it's a double meaning now. Uh, bon at the moulin, M-O-U-L-I-N. And then second word, de la, third word, two words, right? Just like in the Spanish, that, that's spelled the same. The uh, right, it's the club of the galette is the name of the club. It's a you can't say it's just a nightclub. This is a daytime scene, of course. Galette is G A L E T T E, G A L E T T E. So again, ball at the I mean dance, of course, at the Moulin de la Galette, 1876. This is one of the most famous and precious paintings. Some of you, if not all of you, must have seen it at some point, and it has every aspect of the impressionist abandonments or most to say most i should say most of uh techniques for realism except one it does have scientific perspective and for uh no, yeah it does it has foreshortening scientific perspective and diminishing size renoir chose the impressionist of course they weren't bound by some oath you know they had to do exactly the same set of new techniques he chose to keep the techniques for realism to depict space in his paintings, most of them, not all of them, unlike Manet uh, and some of the other impressionists. So here, we'll get to that when we do the form analysis. We have Renoir's slightly different version of impression, but it does have all the other things. It's got very diffused modeling. That's actually even a better word than uh, minimal. But in that uh, painting of the Pfeiffer, it wasn't really diffused. It was just not much there. So Renoir is famous for this. Die, that's a D I F F, right? Not D E. Diffused modeling is a signature motif, right? Technique associated with almost all, every Renoir painting. He loved to use that. So there's no sharp realist. Again, this is part of what makes impressionism, and that makes it's part of the meaning, the style, of course. So you see that, and there's also no sharp realistic cement texture. It's implied, but it's not sharp and realistic. And then there is no line as outline, nowhere. Look carefully, it, it's all patches of different colors, mostly blues and, and off whites, and I guess some yellows for the straw hats on the men. Um, so what are we looking at? The settings part of the meeting. Oh, it's unique. It's still there. At least last time I was in Paris, might not be now, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, after COVID, it might, might have uh, gone belly up. But this is one of the many famous, uh, sorry, most, I meant to say, one of the most famous nightclubs in Paris. But if you say nightclub, you might say, well, then what are they doing there in the daytime? Obviously, they could have daytime events, and he attended those because this is depicting, and I'll say this slowly repeated, the leisure time of the new French middle class, which he was a part of, by the way. Now, he became wealthy. He became Renoir, the wealthiest of all the Impressionists during his lifetime. And then after he died, Monet lived on many more years, and, and he even became more wealthy. But during their lifetimes, they were mostly not very wealthy. They weren't poor. He, he never starved. His painting sold. He, he earned a, a nice living, but he eventually became the Renoir became the most uh, the wealthiest, and some would say the most popular with the masses or the mainstream audiences because his themes were about them, about the people who bought his paintings, the middle class who could afford to buy a painting by a new and up and coming artist for the first time because there was no middle class in Paris. Oh, there was a minimal middle class in Paris in, in you know, the early 1800s, right? right after the French Revolution, there was a very small middle class. So by the time this is painted, the French middle class had grown to become the, the largest segment of the population. The largest portion of the French population was middle class. And he depicted their leisure time. This is like, you know, Saturday afternoon, probably, uh, maybe Sunday, but probably Saturday when they had the weekends. That's another thing. They started having weekends, both Saturday and Sunday off. The middle class professional people did. And they could uh, afford to both with time-wise and financially relax with their friends, of course pre-pandemic stuff. I mean, you can see this is a crowded room. That nightclub became famous for another reason, not just because it catered to that new middle class. Yes, it did. And because it was painted several times by uh, both Renoir and I think Monet did too. Anyway, just say several impressionists, including Renoir, painted it. That right there would have made it famous. But there's another reason. Let's go up to the top here. And what are we seeing here? 
wait a minute, that's trees, trees growing up towards the sky above the top uh, edge of the, the painting. And yet there are chandeliers hanging. That's impossible. Think about it. There's an open sky with trees growing up, you know, 15, 20 feet above the top of the painting. Then where are the chandeliers hanging from? They're not hanging from the trees. So that's what made this most famous. It was a very clever design of a metal shed style or metal frame, just a metal frame roof with glass skylights and holes cut in every so many feet for trees to grow through. <laughs> so no other nightclub or club of any kind, at least at that time in Paris, had that combination of the indoor-outdoor effect. People loved it both daytime and evening, because at night the lights made it pretty in a different way. Right? It was a very popular, you can see how crowded it is. So he depicted it because he liked to hang out there. And some people think this is his uh, fiance. She is in the next painting for sure, she's in the next one. But these are friends of his, no question he knew these people. And uh, I'm sure he talked to them about giving permission to be you know, in his painting. Um, and then we have other people he's depicting at the point where they're enjoying, of course, an afternoon out with their friends, dancing, drinking, gossiping, what have you. Okay, and then there's one other signature motif that marks this as specifically Renoir's own technique and his additional idea or he added this to impressionistic uh techniques and that's called the dappled that's you know with a p p l e d dappled sunlight effect look carefully and you notice that it looks some people have looked at it and say well that looks like somebody you know like some little kid with chalk on their hands after you know preschool class came home to see their, you know, the dad came home and they patted him on the back of his jacket and he didn't notice that there was chalk dust there. No, no, that's the sun filtering through this, you know, glass ceiling above them. And you see it on the faces. It's really nicely done here. So that's another kind of modeling, which is not super sharp. It's still soft and diffused, but here it is, is uniquely appropriate for this scene because this is one of those, it's even visible on her forehead. You see that? Right, uh, and on the top of this guy's hat, the dappled sunlight effect is a is a, a technique developed or invented, you could say, by uh, <clears throat> Renoir, and then other impressionists copied it after that. So this has all those elements. Okay, one last thing about Renoir: there are times I've traveled to four continents, and on every continent, including in Egypt, <laughs> and all over Russia and other parts of Europe, and uh, in China, in Vietnam in Mexico, in Cuba, I have seen prints on people's walls of Renoir paintings. He is that popular with people around the world. But there have been some critics, you know, critics, God love them, they have to knock other people's creativity when they can't create their own works of art, uh, who have said, oh, Renoir, he shouldn't be admired at all. All he did was paint pretty pictures of, you know, well-off middle-class people. He never addressed any social issues. There's an element of truth to that although it's not quite true. He did do some paintings that dealt with social issues. They're not as famous or as popular, or as well known, and they're a much smaller percentage. But the main point of that is, I would just ask this, and if I was in a debate over that tech, tech, uh, fact, I'm sorry, that fact about Renoir, where is the rule written that every famous or great work of art has to only depict suffering. It's important not to ignore it, and we all know that for a lot of obvious reasons, but to say that's the only fit topic for paintings to be, or any work of art or style of art to be considered uh, worthy of, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's a silly attitude. Life encompasses a lot of things, including sometimes just enjoying other people's company, and that's what he focused most of his career on, so some people find that meaning, uh, that makes him, I mean, in the meaning of his paintings, less important. Uh, I don't agree with it, but, you know, each person to their own. Formal analysis. Well, I already mentioned he uses all techniques, but I'm going to list them now for realistic space. Overlapping, diminishing size, uh, foreshortening on the shoulders of these people here, you know, like his. Uh, and here there isn't, I don't know if there's atmospheric, yeah, there is, there's atmospheric perspective on the, yeah, on the outer, and there is a scientific perspective, there is a vanishing point. Uh, then we have the rhythm, well, oh boy, is it powerful with the dancing couples, the top hats, the straw hats, you can see the stuffier people are wearing <laughs> the top hats and the younger, more hip ones are wearing the straw hat was a new thing back then. 
And then we have no line is outlined, none. Soft diffuse modeling on everything, the people, the clothing, the, uh, the trees, the chandeliers. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course, of the hats and the heads and arms. It is mostly stable. Look carefully. The figures uh, dancing are almost all upright. So are the tree trunks, at least, and not the branches. The chandeliers, right angles, and the people at this table all sitting upright. Only this one was leaning over at, a, at a much of an angle. So it's mostly stable with some dynamic detail. The largest mass, I guess I'd call this one mass, this group of friends at the table that are all together, clearly, and they are personal acquaintances of the artist. Uh, if you call that one mass, then that's the largest mass. And then I guess you could say this group here that's walking by, and then maybe this couple would be the third largest. Uh, the colors, mostly cool, aren't they? Shades of blue and uh, white. But there's some warm colors, of course, uh, on the, uh, obviously the faces and hands, the skin tones, and the uh, yellow straw hats. Uh, but most of the uh, upper part of the painting, the greens and the trees, well, the trunks are warm, but and those chandeliers, those are cool greens and uh, blues. Uh, and it's balanced, roughly balanced. Well, I've had people say, oh, there's an empty space around this couple. That's true. Uh, you could say the same here, right? It looks like a kid looking through uh, where this guy is leaning over towards the tree here, towards this group. In any case, you could make, it's up to you. I wouldn't argue with anyone. If, they, if this is on the final and someone wrote that it was unbalanced, they felt towards the right, I wouldn't uh, dispute that. But it has a rough balance feeling. And top to bottom, it's definitely unbalanced toward the bottom because of the, of the uh, empty space near the top. And I already mentioned the similar texture is also diffused and not sharp, it's implied only. All right, this is one I won't cut from the study list. It might be equally famous for some of you if you've seen any of Renoir's most famous paintings. You've probably seen this. Renoir again, R-E-N-O-I-R. -E and the title of this is Luncheon. It's much easier to spell. Luncheon of the Boating Party. Luncheon, of course, is L-U-N-C-H-E-O-N. -E of the Boating Party, 1881. If you ever get to Washington, D.C., you'll probably spend, well, if it's safe, hopefully it will be next time I'm planting my daughter there next summer. Uh, some of the famous landmarks and museums, but also oh, one of the lesser known ones is where this painting is. It's called the Phillips Gallery, and it's not anywhere near the mall. It's a couple miles north of there. Where is it? South? Anyway, away from the mall. They own a bunch of world-class paintings, small, high-quality museum. Most people never even go there unless they live in the D.C. area. Phillips, as in, you know, the last name, not Phillips apostrophe, yes. Phillips Gallery owns this. And they bought it for a mere, I think it was three or four million dollars, or maybe less. It might even have been hundreds of thousands. It's worth several tens of millions right now, <laughs> if it were to be auctioned. Why is this one of his most popular paintings and images of it, like I said, have been reproduced all over the world? Because it does, again, capture that, which you already wrote, but if you didn't then, and for this one, you should be writing definitely. The main theme of his paintings is the good life or leisure life of the new French middle classes, the people he associated with. This is his fiance and her little dog. <laughs> right? And these are friends of his. He knew all of these people. Uh, and they would go out on a boat here. Let's go out. You see a sailboat there. See on the Seine. The Seine runs all the way across that part of France, of course, not just through Paris. And so you could take a boat from Paris and go out into the countryside and spend the afternoon. That's what they're doing. They're relaxing and enjoying this new leisure life. Even some of them, when they were younger professionals, if they're in their 30s or 40s, wouldn't have had the time or the money to do this. But by the 1880s, yes, the, the, they, they could easily, if they were middle class professional people, they would have both the time and the means or wherewithal to relax in this kind of a setting. And so they're having a lunch and the boy isn't it a, a, a attractive looking French lunch. The grapes, the wines, uh, and of course fruits. And uh, I'm sure they just already finished the main course. So he's not depicting anything with a deeper meaning, but the style, remember, is one of the main facts about any Impressionist painting is what makes it Impressionist. <clears throat> However, he's playing around a little bit here. I already said he did continue to use, and here he does too, May, the main techniques for depicting space. This has scientific perspective, 
And that's clearly atmospheric perspective out there on the water, right? <clears throat> it has overlapping foreshortening and diminishing size. But then he plays around with it because the tent roof and the railing don't line up with each other. Look carefully, they don't line up correctly. This is done freehand. So he probably only used a vanishing point for the background, if that, and maybe the people. Yeah, the people lining up. So there probably is a vanishing point, most historians agree, and you'd have to x-ray it to know for sure. Uh, in any case, we'll say it, it most likely has a vanishing point, it definitely has scientific, sorry, atmospheric perspective, overlapping and foreshortening and diminishing size. But there is an incorrect use on the deck, you can call it, what else is it? The railing and the, and the, the roof there, uh, the deck, I guess it's the deck of the, whatever club they've gone to eat at. Uh, and and those th those details, the railing and the roof don't line up correctly. So he he didn't strictly follow the Renaissance rules of realism, even when he did use realistic techniques for space. And then we also have the fact, some of you probably already noticed, that here there is simulated texture. You'd have to say it's soft and diffuse, but it is not only implied on his arm, the skin on his arm, and you could say somewhat on his face, and to some degree this guy here his hair, right? And his face. Whereas the figures in the background are all soft and diffused with no realistic simulated texture or modeling. Uh, some think they see, uh, you know, actual simulated texture on the skin and muscles of this guy's arm and his beard, which I would agree with. Um, there we go. Yeah, not so much on the hat. And then his fiance is strictly an impressionistic uh, figure, as is the dog and most of the objects on the table. So you have, you know, a little more realism uh, in, let's just say, the, the, the three men at the extremes on the far right and far left of this painting tend to have more realistic cement textures and modeling than all the other figures and objects do. Otherwise, it's, it fits all. There's no outline as outline here. Even with that, uh, it is patches of color. Again, his arm, the colors of the skin of this guy's arm or patches of, you know, kind of a <laughs> pinkish color uh, against the background of these very rapid, you know, little smaller patches of green and blue in the weeds behind them. Okay, and then we have the fact that it just basically is typically, oh, there's no dappled sunlight here. Why? Well, maybe a little bit on her hat. Let's look. Yeah, okay, just on her hat. She's the only one leaning into the sun. You see that? That's why. Otherwise, you'd see it. Uh, here. So he didn't use much, if hardly any of that technique on this painting because it wasn't uh, appropriate. Okay, so let's do the formal analysis on this. Um, it is balanced. Again, remember Renoir was the most popular during his lifetime of all the Impressionists. And uh, well, there's some debate where it's the wealthiest. So I guess we should just say one of the two or three wealthiest uh, of all the uh, French Impressionists. Long before he passed away, he was able to lead you know pretty nice life a country estate because of his paintings being so popular and selling so well okay then we have the rhythm of the wine bottles wine glasses uh, of course the arms heads hands uh and hats of the people and the colors more cool than than uh in the foreground i should say more cool on the clothing of the people including the of course the the tablecloth and, and i would say also the glasses and then the background as well, the middle section there's warm. Of course, all the skin tones are warm, obviously, and the hair on the people. And the roof of this uh, tent or deck roof, if you want to call it that, uh, the railing as well. So it's a mixture of warm and cool. Um, and then it's dynamic and stable. I used to say it was mostly stable because these figures are upright, the poles you know, uh, supporting the roof over them and the railings here, that's all stable, the edges of the table but people are leaning over and there's curved decor uh, details on the hats and the tops of people's heads. So it's, it's both. I already mentioned the techniques for space and that there's no line as outlined here. The largest mass, I'd say it's a table probably. Uh, and then it's, if you count, I would certainly think of this as one mass, these three figures overlapping each other. So they would be the second largest. Some would think they're the, the largest mass. It depends on what you draw the edges of the table in your mind. So these are the two largest. And then the man leaning backwards, certainly he would be in the dish. Notice they're two, two most prominent, largest, closest depicted male figures are both wearing sleeveless t-shirts. <laughs> I guess that's so they can row more easily or something. Okay, and uh, let's see. Um, 
let's see, modeling. Yeah, I already mentioned modeling is, is of course soft and diffuse. All right, let's do, let's see how we're doing. One more and we'll take our break. Uh, and we should still be able to end early, uh, but the break will be the usual 15 minutes because I think we can always use that. This is another Renoir, it's not a must know, country dance. And here you see he used realism on the faces of the couple. They were just married, as in it was, they were either friends or friends of friends, and he, he was invited to the wedding. Whereas uh, most of her, the bottom of her dress from about the waist down, and really his clothes and all of his clothes, and the figures in the background are all impressionistic. So it's another classical Renoir kind of playing around type effect of some small sections of realism and the rest is impressionist. Okay, this is the next must know and then we'll take a break. This is um, Pissarro, or did I cut it from the study list? My goodness, I gave you guys a break. Okay, I'll just tell you what it is. It's such a classic example of fully impressionist painting by one of the founders of impressionism one of the earliest impressionists, and he never abandoned it. So you don't have to write this since I took it off the syllabus, you guys get a break. Pissarro, P-I-S-S-A-R-O, some of you've heard of him. There are paintings of his in the museums of San Francisco. And you know, you guys, some of you are starting to go and you just have to show me a receipt or uh, some proof that you were at one of the museums that you paid to enter during this semester and you get 10 points extra credit. Whatever you do once you get inside is up to you. Anyway, Pissarro is really popular. He was very popular with uh, especially Parisian art collectors, because he painted Paris first, mostly scenes in the city, and then he decided to go out into the countryside and do what most impressionists did, paint landscapes in the latter half of his career. That's typical, of, you'll hear that after the break. Really important slides coming up after the break, and that includes at least three that I won't cut from the study list. Rodin, the sculptor, of course, Monet, one of the two Monets, I won't say which one, and Mary Cassatt, the first famous woman painter in America. Uh, we'll talk about them right after the break. Uh, this one though, so it's not on the side list, so we'll wrap it up quickly. This shows a street scene. He could see a view from his window of his apartment in Paris. He had a fifth floor a studio and apartment. Um, and of course he's watching, and if it's obvious, late fall, just before the winter. So probably November, I've been in Paris every month of the year, except April. <laughs> which is there's a song called April from Paris. It's the only month I've never been to Paris. It's, it's my favorite city in the world. And if you ever go there, if you haven't, you, you might feel the same. So he loved his city, his native city. So he's capturing the, you know, the, the leafless trees and the moment or that period between late afternoon and early evening. As the street lamps go on, they were still gas. They hadn't electrified yet. Um, and then, you know, the impressionist effect of the fading light reflecting off the top of each carriage, you see that, and on the street itself and the awnings, it's it's just brilliant. But he does use atmospheric perspective, you don't have to write this because in the distance, and this probably has scientific, as it probably has a matching point. And it obviously has for shortening and diminishing size and overlapping. So the is another one of those like Renoir who didn't abandon all of the uh, rules of realistic uh, space techniques, but there's no lines. And, and no outline, and there's, you know, of course, soft, diffuse modeling and similar textures. Okay, so this does fit the definition of an impressionist painting by one of the all time greats. It's called the Boulevard, just for those who might be interested to know. The title of this is Boulevard Houseman. It's actually at the Metropolitan Museum. I took this slide as my own photo at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And uh, it's one of about five in all in one room. I'd call it Pissarro Room. <clears throat> they don't have an official name for it, but it's a wonderful collection if you like this type of urban scene as an impressionist composition. And the thing is, Boulevard Hausmann, what? That's a German. Yep, that's a German last name, but this is France. And they were fighting the Germans. Before this painting, they fought them in a big war. Probably most of you never heard of the Franco-Prussian War. And they suffered. Paris was besieged by the Germans and then later taken over by the communists and then recaptured blood in the streets. I mean, literally tens of thousands of people died in that year of that first, the war and then the communist uprising. So Paris had suffered mildly. Why would they name one of their main boulevards after a German? Because he was of mixed uh, heritage, German and French. And he had trained, I believe in Germany. In any case, he had trained somewhere outside Paris as a, as a uh, urban planner. And that was a new profession. There hadn't been any urban planning before, unless a king decided to appoint someone to redo a certain neighborhood. So this whole part of Paris, every section of the uh, main central areas of Paris, 
both sides of the river, you know, and the buildings in them, including these, were brand new at the time. Paris is, is an ancient city the Romans founded. It's 2,000 years old. But there are parts of it that go back that far. But most of it is from the last half of the 1800s, because that's when this guy was hired by the emperor. He was an emperor, Napoleon's nephew, became a dictator and did whatever he wanted. So he hires a German-trained uh, French, Amer French German mixed nationality of early example of urban planner to come in and totally knock down all the medieval buildings, <laughs> wipe them out, and then rebuilt them with the buildings you see in Paris today. And that's what we're looking at here. These wonderful buildings with almost equal heights, roof lines are all about seven or eight stories, and you know, ornate decorative details on the doors and windows, chimney pots. I mean, it's what Paris is famous for. And that's due to this guy, Hausman. So they named one of their main photos after him. Okay, here we are right at the time for our uh, break. Let's do a 15 minute break. And I'll see you back here. This is a Degas. It will be our next must know. So on the syllabus. Okay, see you guys in um, about, uh, in fact, 15 minutes exactly. Okay, um, this is the next must know. And uh, it's probably the most famous painting by our next artist, Degas. And the title is The Dance Class, just like it sounds, The Dance Class class. Degas is D-E-G-A-S, 1875. Okay, so who was Degas? Well, he was one of those people who moved in and out of, back and forth, you could even say, between the Impressionist movement and some uh, independent semi-realistic paintings. This is one of those that has both some areas of realism and others of Impressionism. That's one of his signature motifs. But he didn't consider himself a full Impressionist, uh, even though he exhibited with them. And uh, it obviously adopted, to will say the evidence is right here in this painting, uh, in this slide, uh, that he adopted many of the techniques of Impressionism. But he never abandoned all of the, you know, techniques of realism that Manet did. He usually, like for instance, in this very painting and many of his other indoor scenes, which he loved painting performing artists, here are ballet dancers. They're not really performing here, they're, they're learning how to become professional, so you could say, but still they are kind of performing. And he even said that, and one of my favorite themes is, it's a signature motif of his, that his themes involved uh, performing artists uh, of various kinds and race horses, <laughs> or race horsing, I should say, because he, he would depict the audience and the jockeys and the horses. So race horsing and uh, performing artists were his two favorite topics. And so when he did an indoor scene, he would like in this one, and we'll see exactly here as we go, which areas are realistic. I think you can already tell that, uh, and which are impressionistic. But a couple more facts about who he was before we get to the details on this slide. Um, he was also uh, one who was in my, one of the first, in fact, one of the first European, you could say just French, or European painters to be influenced by Japanese prints. We covered, remember, Japanese art. And I told you that you'll see when we get to Impressionism, the overlapping influences. Well, that includes the oblique angle the sharp diagonal, you could say, but the word that's proper term for it is oblique, like the word oblique angle. And he adopted that directly from Japanese prints. And another is uh, geometric decorative patterns in some of the details. For instance, the mirror and the wall here, these are marble columns and they have decorative patterns. Now they're done in an impressionistic way, not sharp and realistic, of course, but that is something he also was inspired by Japanese prints to do. Okay, other than that though, his other signature motif, as I just mentioned, was the mixture of realism and impressionism in the same painting and his use of or depicting scenes with performing artists and uh, you could say athletes and artists. Okay, so that fits all, all of his signature motifs are evident here. So what's realistic? Well, the floorboards actually is lying here. 
that outlines the floorboards. The instructor is fairly realistic. It's not super sharp, but in, on his face, I'd say it is. His head, I even it's his hair and his skin, and on his clothes, um, even down to his shoes. So the instructor is more real. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, more realistic than most of the other figures. But these two young dancers or two two girls here are also partly realistic the upper part of their bodies from around the waist up through their you know their backs their shoulders their their, their heads and the sides of their faces right she looks like she's bored and <laughs> i think he's trying to capture you know <clears throat> somebody who feels a little bit entitled maybe uh these had to be wealthy before this guy was a famous they know who he was he was one of the probably the most famous uh dance instructor in paris at that time very popular classes i'm sure they're waiting list so the upper half of the two closest uh, dancers or girls are done realistic style even this girl's sash but here from the waist down her, her dress or tutu right and all of the body of this of the sorry again the tutu and the sash of this girl are impressionistic. Then we get back down to her legs and they're fairly realistic. <laughs> Little dog there. But the background is entirely impressionistic and most of the figures are beyond the middle ground, the, the figures in the distance. So you see it's a mixture of the two. Um, and then we, I just said, as part of the meaning, remember because of the techniques that define it as a, a mixture of realism and impressionism, there is scientific perspective, no question. There'd be a vashing point beyond the wall. There's obvious foreshortening diminishing size, overlapping. There's no atmospheric perspective. I wouldn't say, well, let's, before I make, maybe, but that's probably more just the uh, translucent glass in the windows. But you, I guess you could say there's a little small section or segment of the painting that does use atmospheric perspective. You, you can make that case. There are lines here, but limited to around the outer edges or the clothing, I should say, of the uh, instructor and the top half of the two bodies of the closest girls and the floorboards. Everything else, there's no lines. And then we have the rhythm, of course, obviously, of their um, <coughs> feet, <laughs> legs, arms, heads, uh, and, and of course, tutus, um, lots of rhythm. And then we have the largest mass be the floor. And then these two girls that are the closest to us, well, this one, pretty with the green sash and the one with the yellow, and, and again, I guess fourth largest, if you broke those two uh, into two separate objects, you'd say the next largest or fourth largest is the instructor. It's almost entirely stable, but it feels dynamic because of the oblique angle or diagonal. So you could say it's both. Uh, you do see here, if you look uh, you know, closely, that the dresses are dynamic or the tutus, but the fingers are mostly upright. So it's a mixture, you just say that. And then uh, is it balanced? No, not really in this case, unless you count the floorboards, which you could as solid mass, but the objects, the placement objects clearly are unbalanced, of course, to the left. And then it's harder to say top to bottom, but I would say it's unbalanced toward the bottom. If you do the line here across the tops of these head, people's heads, even though there is a wall, which is solid, there aren't as many objects. So it's unbalanced toward the bottom and the left. Uh, the colors cool on the tutus, warm on the skin. I would say the floorboards are mostly warm. It depends on how you look. But the, his clothing is uh, is definitely cool, and the walls are cool. Shades of green and gray. Okay, now the next one I was going to make a must know. The dance class, by the way, uh, I just we just finished, so you shouldn't have trouble just inserting this in the margin on your notes. Is a very important slide. I'm not cutting. It's one of the most famous impressionist or semi-impressionist paintings of all time. This is not as famous, and I got to give you a break. I promise to cut at least one. So let's see, how many do we have? I might cut two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Well, I'll cut this and we'll see if I might cut one more uh, before we get to the uh, last slide. Degas, the glass of absinthe, a-B-S-I-N-T-H-E, but you don't have to write that because I've just said you can cross your, take your pen, and if you want to right now, you should go ahead and do that before you forget. Cross out this title only because even though I love this painting, and if anyone here knows what absinthe is, please speak up. If you haven't ever tried it, it's legal again. It was illegal when I first started teaching in the United States for years. 
and it had been for decades. Why? Why would it be illegal? Does anybody know what absinthe is or has anybody tried it? Nope. You can, I think you can get it in some bars here in California. You definitely can get it on the East Coast and you can order it online. <laughs> I have a nephew-in-law who's ordered it regularly because he got the taste for it when he was in uh, Prague or Budapest. Okay, so let's cross out that before we move on to briefly summarize what this was about, this scene. Uh, but it won't be on the test. The God, the glass of absinthe, you can cross that out. Okay, absinthe is a very powerful alcoholic drink. Not only is it high potency alcohol content, I think it's like 20 or 40%, and somewhere in that range, uh, but it also has uh, toxic chemicals in it. Uh, I think wormwood is one of them, and then it tastes like licorice, and some people like it for that reason, but it has the potency of the strongest alcoholic drink, plus some say a slightly hallucinogenic effect. Certainly if you drank three glasses, which Van Gogh used to do regularly when he could afford to, or was given them free by local cafe, we'll talk about him next week, cafe owners, sometimes they would give him free food or drink because he was always poor, Van Gogh. Um, he drank it a lot, and some think that's how he got the ideas for his paintings. I, I think that's simplistic, but in any case, it can induce hallucinations. But that's not what the point of this painting is. Absinthe was accepted uh, among all classes in, in um, France at this time. It was legal, and it was served all over the country. So it's not about, you know, indulging in some extreme, you know, uh, let's say, addiction or something. It's about a relationship. I love the way this uh, is depicted. Here we have a couple. Look at her. Look at her face. Look at the expression. Her body language, her slumped shoulders. And look at him. Is he paying any attention to her? No, he's probably looking at the next woman walking in the door of this bar. He couldn't care less about her. And she knows it. And she's dejected, depressed, and disillusioned. And I would say that that is the main point of this painting. In fact, it's pretty obvious that she's drowning her sorrows in a glass of absinthe, but she's probably had more than one because, well, it's hard to say this is, you know, like a liter here, right? It looks like a, not a half liter, right? So, you know, she may be continuously drinking as the evening wears on to be able to numb her, her pain and uh, her humiliation. She's in a relationship that clearly is one-sided where he's the dominant figure and he doesn't care about her feelings, let alone her happiness. And uh, so if she finally has an epiphany like that woman in the uh, awakening conscience we saw in the second slide tonight, she may get up and walk out on the person there, that loser, but uh, she hasn't had the courage yet. So it's a pretty powerful message, subtle in a way as it is in the way this is depicted. When you start looking at the clues, you can see that very, very strong. Okay, now we get to... Uh, one of the most important uh, artists of the entire evening tonight, Mary Cassatt. Only one of these is a must know. So I'm going to work up to her uh, must know, but you should start taking notes now because who was she? Some of you know. The first famous American woman painter, period. No debates, no arguments over that. I'll say again. She was Mary Cassatt, the first famous woman or American woman painter. Why or how? Well, she started her career in Philadelphia. You could just say in the United States, you know, but she was from Philadelphia. And she could not get enough commissions to support herself because women weren't given the chance in any of the arts. And the proof of that is, of course, an architecture we'll get to. Remember, we're going to cover our 20th century architecture when we talk about Julia Morgan. There will be at least one slide of her work on the final. Um, she was the first woman architect. And if they knew that she was a woman, they wouldn't have hired her. She'd signed her bids for, you know, new contracts. J, as in the first initial J, period, Morgan. People thought it was Joe or Jim. And then she'd show up and they'd be shocked. Well, Mary Cassatt figured out that she couldn't make a living. So she moved to France to Paris because she knew about the Impressionist movement and wanted to uh, join it. And guess who gave her the opportunity? Degas became a lifelong friend of hers, a supporter of her art, 
And she did the same for him because he wasn't known in America back then. Moment the presses weren't known at all outside of France for the first 20 years at least until they became mainstream. So by 1890s, they were. But we're talking about the 1870s. So what happened? Well, he decided he wanted to sell some of his paintings in America. And if it wasn't for her, he probably never would have become well known here and, and you know, sold quite a few of his paintings. He toured the United States with her. They were just friends. There's no evidence of any intimacy between them, but they exchanged long letters. And when they were not in the same city, they would stay in touch by, by letter. And they supported each other. It's really a great you know, part of what is a tradition in many cultures, most cultures, where there is, you know, full-time professional art is a, is, a, is a career you can actually make a living at, where, you know, with any luck, you meet someone who supports you and gets you entree. And so he introduced her to the other impressionists, and she became popular with, with them as well. Her paintings then began to sell. The other thing about her that's important, besides being the first woman art, uh, the famous American woman painter, is her signature motifs. And I'll start with the most important one. She focused her entire career on domestic or family life. In other words, scenes of family life. You might think, what's the big deal? Oh, no, that was radical. back <laughs> then. The only scenes of home life, domestic life, family life, all the above, which are different ways of saying the same thing, that were being painted was the artist painting their own families or occasionally some rich person's family who commissioned just a portrait of them, you know, uh, standing in their rich home, right? That's not what she did. She painted average, everyday, middle-class French and Americans, who were many Americans already living in Paris like her, uh, and now some of them were mixed, you know, French husband, uh, American wife, or vice versa. So she would paint uh, people every day, you know, middle-class, is a majority member now, uh, citizens at home and often with their children. And that was not being done, and nobody would have thought you could make a living doing that, but she did. She became very famous for it. And there's a theory, it's part of the meaning of who she was, that she did that because she couldn't have children. We don't know why. And there's some evidence she may have had a miscarriage back in uh, Pennsylvania before she came or even early on when she went to France. But there's no evidence to prove she even had any intimate romantic relationships after she arrived. We know it wasn't that way with Degas. So we don't know of any proof that she had some medical reason, but she it was clear she was not a family uh, person and she could not have children. That much I think has been determined by research. Why we don't know those theories. Just say, since she herself could not have a family and she wanted to focus on a career in any case, she used her you know, knowledge of painting and her connections with her friends in France to depict family life. Some would say to sublimate her you know, inability, but that's very Freudian. There's no proof of that. It could be. Okay, what's the other signature motifs? Uh, the last things about the meaning are the oblique angle. Guess who influenced her to do that? Degas, her friend, and Japanese prints. So she was also inspired by Japanese print techniques. This is such an obvious oblique angle. Now, this is not the must know. We're working up to it. The must know uh, is coming up as the bath. Casado spelled, you know, and write it so you have the title ready when we get to that slide and, and uh, you could just start filling in the meaning. C-A-S-S-A-T-T, -S -S -A -T -T, Cassat, the bath, 1891. That's clearly not this one. This is called the cup of tea. Uh, and here it is. So she makes realism and impressionism. Look at this woman's glove and you know her whole you know lower arm and hand and the teacup. Those are realistic. Every other detail is impressionistic. So oblique angles, right? And a mixture of realism and impressionism in the same painting. Those are two of her signature motifs, along with focusing on family life. This woman was a mother, and she also painted her, this woman's children. But here she just painted the woman herself, relaxing uh, in an armchair, obviously, probably in her own living room. Okay, and then we have one more uh, motif that she developed. Uh, other impressionists didn't very much. In fact, didn't really at all that she borrowed from Japanese. So the final fourth, I guess, and final signature motif is that she uh, showed decorative geometric patterns on many or some of the, I'll just say some of the objects in almost all her paintings. Here it's on the armchair. You'll see it in the, the bath, the must know too, on the rugs. 
Okay, so a mixture of realism and impressionism, and then the use of uh, geometric patterns on some of the objects in her paintings. Usually the objects in the foreground, but not always. Sometimes they were in the background. Here we have a flower box, of course, that is uh, impressionistic. Everything else about this is, but since it's not the must know, we're going to go forward. Here's another version. She painted the series, lots of impressions did this with the same title, you know, sometimes two or three, sometimes 15, 20. Monet did like two dozen of the same scene. We'll talk about that when we finish up uh, tonight in a few more slides with Monet. But here we are with Mary Cassatt, two friends in the living room, one of the two of them, probably gossiping, it's hard to know. And the realism again is, is limited to at least this woman's gloved hands and arms and uh, somewhat her face, maybe this woman's hair, certainly, to some degree, and the teacup. The rest of everything is uh, impressionistic. The service, the silver service, right? Fireplace, the wallpaper, see, there's your geometric patterns. And here again, always, 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 she loved the oblique angle. We're not looking at them straight on. We're looking at them from a diagonal. And of course, it's a scene of domestic life. And it's the mixture we already talked about of realism and impressions. But now we get to probably her most famous painting. In fact, we have a refrigerator. Yeah. We have a refrigerator magnet of this scene that's been on our refrigerator since my daughter arrived the day we brought her home from Russia. And that's over 15 years ago. And she still looks at it every so often. Okay, so it's called The Bath. I gave you the title. And this is classic Mary Cassatt. Because here she's painting a woman who we know who she was, was a young mother, a French, uh, sorry, an American woman married to a Frenchman and living in Paris and had several children. And this is her uh, young, at the time was her youngest daughter. And that whole section, the mother and the daughter are realistic, aren't they? There's really not anything impressionistic, maybe the, the cloth over the, the lap across the lap of the little girl. But the woman entirely, everything, her hair, her hands, her dress, and all of the skin and hair of the little girl are realistic. And then everything around them is impressionistic. So these are the facts now about the meaning. Remember that mark it as a Cassatt painting. Obviously it's a scene of family life, right? Or, or a domestic life. And then we have the oblique angle. Wow, it's just, you know, it's like it draws you in. There's a whole point. Why did she use that just to imitate French? Uh, I'm sorry, I mean um, Japanese prints, or just because her friend Degas told her to? No, because she liked the idea of why Japanese had originally invented that technique and why some impressionist uh, borrowed it. Uh, that would be, it draws the viewer into the scene in a new way, rather than just a straight over and over again, head on, direct, you know. Uh, face to face view. Okay, so we walked into the room like maybe we're the, the, the other parent here or a family member coming in on this scene. And then we have the uh, geometric patterns here, they're on the wallpaper, on the dresser, and on the rug. They're all over on this one. And of course, we already mentioned what's realistic and what's uh, cemented texture. So we, all of the, her signature motifs are very clearly visible here. So let's do the formal analysis. Well, diffuse modeling, right, is on the, on the picture. I should say the basin, I guess it's a basin or a bowl, you could call it a bowl of water, all of the background and foreground. And yet sharp and realistic cement textures are visible on the two human figures, their hair, their clothing, their skin. Uh, this is, of course, because of the diagonal angle, the oblique angle, a dynamic and mixed stable. The dresser, the wall behind them are stable. Uh, the girl's upper body is pretty stable. Uh, but her arms and legs are, and her mother's body is diagonal. Of course, the objects are, so it's a mixture. Here, there is no scientific perspective, no atmospheric perspective. There's foreshortening and overlapping, and I don't see diminishing size here. There aren't enough objects uh, arranged in this scene. So just overlapping and foreshortening is the only techniques for space. There is line here, and it's bold outline, especially along, around the little girl, but also the mother's dress. And then there is the warm colors of the rugs and the wallpaper and the dresser, the cool colors on the mother's dress. And their hair is both dark black, so that'd be neutral, of course, and warm colors on their skin and cool on the water in the picture. Um, the rhythm is obvious with the arms, hands, legs, the stripes of the mother's dress and so forth. 
the largest mass, clearly the mother, then the daughter, and then probably a close second would be, or third rather, I mean, would be the dresser. And I guess fourth would be the, the basin. That's how they bathed, right? They didn't have indoor plumbing, at least in many parts of Paris. Okay, uh, and let's see, balance, yes. Oh, absolutely, she loved balancing things. This area of the mother's body balances the picture. The daughter is right across the middle. The background is almost the same area as the foreground, roughly anyway, pretty close. Between here and the border at the bottom and between the mother's top of her head and the top border, it's pretty much the same space. Okay, um, let's see, I already mentioned, oh, the modeling is, again, sharp and realistic on the two human figures and soft and diffused everywhere else. Okay, it's another view of it, but that's not as accurate a color, uh, the, the first one is. Uh, some of these were extra slides added to my own list by the slide librarian, but it was nice of to do it. But the, the actual colors, by the way, are these colors. The, the print is guess where it is, as is, you're going to hear this a lot between now and the end of next week, the Art Institute of Chicago, you can't find anywhere as good a collection, even in New York or Washington, as they have. Because for some reason, millionaires in France, especially their wives, the, the really educated upper classes, of course, of that era in Chicago, were Francophiles. They love France and they would go to France and they'd see these paintings and say, oh, it's, they're cheap. Of course, they were cheap at first because nobody bought them in France or anywhere else until they became, after you know a few decades, accepted the Impressionists. So they bought up a lot of famous Impressionist paintings and donated them to the, all of them to the one main art, well, there's several art museums in Chicago, but the main one is the Art Institute. Right downtown, if you're on a layover with more than three hours, you know, make it five because you can take the subway, get off right in front of that museum. It's worth it, even if you only have two hours. You'll be amazed at how many world famous paintings there are there of both Impressionist and Post Impressionist. Okay, now we're getting to Monet, the other really important artist of this second half of tonight. This isn't the must know. But let's talk about who he was. Let's start with um, spelling. His last name is M-O-N-E-T. Of course, uh, just one letter different, I know, than Mane. And the first must know is, I'll show it to you, this Rouen Cathedral. So I'll go ahead and spell it, and then we'll talk about who he was with that uh, previous slide. But this is part of the meaning of both the two Monet slides. Rouen, R-O-U-E-N. It's, it's a city in northern France. It's where Joan of Arc was uh, burned at the stake. And they have a statue over there for that reason. R-O-U-E-N, Rouen Cathedral Portal. Three words, Rouen Cathedral Portal, 1894. We'll get to the details on this painting, but now... Again, you, you should take notes. Who was Monet? One of the first two Impressionists. Nobody debates that anymore. Some, therefore, consider him, he's even been called the father of Impressionism, but that, that's too simplistic. You have to give equal credit to Monet. Uh, he didn't name himself any of those uh, titles. He wasn't egotistical, uh, and he wasn't trying to get publicity. He was just trying to make a living and, and do what he loved. He was, of course, brilliant. He was one of the first two Impressionists. So he helped invent Impressionism, you could say that. Therefore, he's one of the founders of the movement itself. No, nobody debates that. And he became the most famous Impressionist of all, and he outlived the others. He lived until almost 1930. That's pretty late. <laughs> These guys were working around 1860, and he lived well into uh, almost the mid-20th century, um, late 20s, actually. And so he lived longer than most Impressionists and became world famous and, yes, quite wealthy the last many, uh, several decades of his life. But he struggled for most of his first 40 years. He, st he nearly starved, and that's no exaggeration. <laughs> he couldn't afford food for many years as a young artist trying to create a new style that he and Manet were both, of course, experimenting with. Okay, so this is a painting. You have to write this part now. They called the uh, 14th of July, which is their equivalent of what we call the 4th of July here or whatever. Anyway, it's their national holiday celebrating the uh, fall of the Bastille. They call it Bastille Day. Some of you know this. It's celebrated here in the Bay Area too at French restaurants. <laughs> uh, in any case, it's, it's a major national holiday. I've been in Paris a couple times on Bastille Day. The whole city just goes out and celebrates. 
starting with some of the streets being, see what they've done. They've closed the street to, to traffic, except foot traffic. There's no, of course, back then there were no vehicles. Well, the word vehicle is a French word, by the way, and it implies carriages too. So yes, carriages are banned as are horses. It's just foot traffic on this whole big boulevard. And then every building has a flag. That's of course the French flag, right? There, everyone knows the three colors, they call it the tricolor. But what I like about this, and we'll go on to the uh, first of two must knows in just about 30 seconds here. Look at the way the flags are depicted and the people in the crowds going in and out of the shadows of the buildings. It's really effective. The effect of uh, how light, here's a bird flying by over the heads of the people. It's in the sunlight. These people are in the shade. These people are in the sunlight. The flags, the wind is making them flutter. I can actually hear the crowds. Well, it helps that I've been in Paris on a day just like this. But even if you never are, you get a sense of the movement, the motion, the fluid scene in front. It's a view from his upper floor apartment slash studio, which he, uh, at this point, I think, by the time he painted this around 1878, he was just starting to be successful, but he still wasn't earning a lot of money. So he was, he was becoming you know, a successful painter by the time he did this. Um, it's early, relatively early. But the flags, I can almost hear the wind, you know, whipping them around as it does when, of course, it's the breeze is stiff as it would be at this point. Okay, so let's move on to the first must know. I already gave you the title. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at one of the many famous, I'll say this slowly, repeat it. One of the many famous series of paintings of the same scene painted multiple times that Monet is famous for. He did that throughout his latter career. He didn't do it as a young painter, but once he became established or successful or famous, however you want to word that, he had the time and the, you know, income stability, if you want to say, you know, financial stability to, to do whatever he wanted instead of trying to please somebody to sell a painting. So he chose to paint the same exact scene multiple times. Why would he do that? He was trying to perfect the techniques of Impressionism. He would show the same exact scene, whether it was a landscape or a building or a still life, from the same scene at different times of the day and different seasons of the year. That's why he did them over and over, to capture the different effects of light on uh, the same objects. Uh, you know, winter, summer, spring, fall, morning, you know, early morning, mid-morning, you know, noontime, afternoon, early evening. And this was one of those series. So this is a scene depicting, has a subtitle, so it's part of the meaning. The other title for this, and this I took this photo, this was at the uh, Met again in New York, um, was um, again the first part of it, Rouen Cathedral Portal, and then in parentheses, I think it even says this at the museum where it's on display, um, <clears throat> morning light summer effect. That says it all. Morning light. He got up early in the morning when the light first hits the entire facade. It's probably not, you know, right after sunrise, but you know, very early morning. Morning light summer effect. The effect of the light in the summer is different, of course, than any other season. And he went back and painted, I think it was over to, well, let's just say multiple views, over a dozen for sure, of this same scene different times of the day, different uh, seasons. In fact, if you do the math, if he painted even four different times of the day, which he would have, I know he always did at least that, and there's four seasons, that's 16 paintings right there of the exact same scene. He loved this cathedral. It is one of the nicer Gothic churches in uh, France. Okay, and then if you get close, look at that. Every color practically, not under the sun, but in an artist's palette <laughs> that he could use, is visible in this section where the uh, the actual see it's actually what it is is the shadow area and then of course the, the glass on this stained glass on the window but look in the shadows even the shadows have multiple colors in them it's not just dark you know gray or brown or, or black shadows are not right solid things <laughs> People paint them that way and have been since the Renaissance. So you see why, again, this was these were brilliant uh, techniques being new ideas being developed by these uh, 
Avant-garde is the word in French, right? A V N. You have to know how to spell it, but A V A N T G A R D E or my aunt in Indiana would call it avant-garde. Them guys that were out ahead. In other words, experimenting and risking, and they were risking, as I've already explained. In his case, <laughs> feeding himself for several years, he literally had to. He was homeless. He had to depend on other artists' uh, generosity to take him in. Slept on one of their their boats. Slept uh, in the back garden shed a couple of times of other people. He even slept on the beach sometimes. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting thing. And they, then by the end of his life, he's one of the wealthiest artists in all in the world, probably. Okay, formal analysis. Well, the modeling here obviously is not sharp. It's diffused, and there's no simulated texture. It's implied. And then we have the rhythm, of course, of the arches, right? the doors, you know, and the little bits of decorative detail. There's sort of hints of statues here. So lots of rhythm. I would call it both stable and dynamic. And individually, the sections of the building are all stable, except the arches above the windows uh, and doors. Uh, of course, that's what Gothic is all about. So other than the details, the building itself is totally stable, but the oblique angle makes it look dynamic. It's a single mass. I don't think you can break it down. For space, there's only overlapping. There's flagpole, and that is a flagpole. I don't even see any other overlapping. And is there foreshortening? I don't really see it, but you could make the case that this might be slightly narrower than the uh, decorative stone above the door that's closest to us. So there's maybe some minimal use of foreshortening and minimal overlapping quite literally otherwise there's no techniques for space uh, realistic techniques there's no line here none zero zip zilch <laughs> and um, the rhythm i already mentioned let's see dynamic and stable what do we feel oh it's balanced yeah i'd say roughly because of the way the towers but then some people feel you can see more of the width of this tower than this one and there's blue sky at the top. So you certainly can make the case it's unbalanced toward the bottom. <laughs> and uh, I guess also you could say it's somewhat unbalanced toward the left. Uh, okay, and again, we covered, I think, the color. Oh, the colors are all the colors under the sun. Apparently, you can't say it that way. That's too extreme. Just say the major primary colors are present here, but the sky is more blue, therefore more cool than the rest of the building, which is more warm, mixed in with a lot of blue and green. You can see that in the different patches. Again, there's your color patch. Evolution. Okay, this is these next two you don't have to write. Again, I took this slide. Now, this is from the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and it's Monet, and it's a haystack. Uh, and it's morning light winter effect. You don't have to write this, but now look carefully. The same exact scene, including the hills, which have snow, you know, a light dusting of snow on them, and these trees barren with no, you know, bright green leaves. Obviously, it's the dead of winter, and the snow over the ground, over the uh, the, the field, the farmer's field, and that's a typical French haystack. I know we the ours are square. Or, they, they love doing conical <laughs> uh, haystacks all over France. Here's the same exact scene, but a little closer. That's true. It's not exactly the same, but it's the same setting of this same farmer's land, which I'm sure you had to ask permission to stand out there and sketch it and then paint it, um, with a haystack. Maybe the same haystack. It doesn't matter. It's in the same place. And we see this is, again, Haystack. It's his Haystack series. He did over two dozen of these. And uh, so this one is, uh, yeah, morning light, summer effect. This is in the summer. It should be obvious. <laughs> the light is coming through in a golden kind of a hue on, you know, and then it, it almost looks like there's snow here, but uh, that would be probably uh, just uh, some kind of a uh, detris from the farm fields when he'd already from what's left over after the harvest. Okay, but this is a really important slide, not cutting it from the study list. Make sure you take very thorough notes and study them carefully for the final. It's about a 50-50 chance of being on the final. This is Monet, again, we've already spelled him, M-O-N-E-T. Title is Japanese Footbridge, one word, Japanese Footbridge and Water Garden. Japanese Footbridge and Water Garden. And the date is 1899. 
Okay, this is one of his most famous paintings, but what's really important to remember about it, if it's on the uh, final, is that it's a uh, classic example, you could even say typical if you, if you prefer, of his later work because it's a scene on his own estate. And that's part of the meaning. It's a really uniquely French story very uniquely French. How did he get an estate? Oh, he just made enough money, he saved up and bought it. Oh, oh, no, no, that's not what's going on here. So how did he get this estate? It was, first of all, you should have the name of it. Uh, you won't be held to the spelling, but you should write it in your notes. G. Verny, or again, if you're from Indiana, Giverny. G-I-V-E-R-N-Y is a small town in uh, central France. So his estate was named Giverny. It's now a museum open to the public. It, it, millions of people, a couple million a year go there. Well, not this last year, <laughs> but uh, they may start coming again. But France is having a horrible outbreak, aren't they? A third wave, I guess it is. Anyway, when it's safe, this museum, this, this estate has become a museum. And it's one of the most popular tourist spots in France outside of Paris, of course. So how did he get it? It was a gift from the government of France. That's an important part of the meaning. I don't know another country that does this. Maybe there probably are some, but I can't think of one on top of my head. He was still struggling, not starving by the time he was in his 40s. But in 1890, it was actually in his 50s by that time, I think. Yeah, actually, yeah, he was in his around 50. Uh, he became well enough known and respected throughout France that the government of France presented an estate of 20 acres with a chateau on the estate that they had seized from a tax dodger, someone who hadn't paid their taxes. The governments have those you know, powers, right? If they find out. So they had seized this estate in a tax seizure, you can call it however you want, a reclaim or whatever. And they turned around and gave it to Monet as a gift from the people of France so that he never had to worry about his mortgage, rent, or housing expenses, or for that matter, food, because everything he did from that point on was income, right? I mean, you know, he, he, he was already well known. So he did, he spent the last 30, some, several, more than 30 years of his life on this day. And while he was there, he developed this series of water lilies, hundreds of paintings of water lilies. Now, when I was a student of art, I got kind of, um, that's what I burned out on too many water lily paintings by Monet, because I had a teacher who was really into it. But you know what, even mm. if that's how you see this is, oh, good God, another water lily painting by Monet. This one's a cut above anybody else's version of the same type of scene. It's obviously a landscape. Again, it should be clear. It's on the out, it's outside on his estate. He designed, these are all the facts about it. You should be writing. He designed that footbridge and he was inspired by Japanese architecture. Many of you know the Japanese tea garden at uh, De Young in the Golden Gate Park Museum next to the De Young, right? Is a Japanese tea garden. They have these kind of footbridges. They're wonderful. Uh, and very visually distinctive. So he created several. He designed them and then hired the people, of course, to build them. So he created this footbridge, but everything else is natural. Or is it? No, now we know he did the landscaping too. Not all of it, not all 20 acres, but when he wanted to paint something, if he felt like changing the arrangement of plants, he would hire, I mean, he would have the garden, gardeners, sorry, gardeners, he'd already hired, you know, landscape crews rearrange things. So he may have done that here. It's hard to say. But what it does is brilliantly capture the, the uh, concept of light in the late afternoon, right? Hitting the bridge, you see it there on the railings, and hitting the water. And then he captured the effect that the bridge and the shadows the bridge would create have on the water lilies. That's exactly what would happen. None would grow underneath the bridge because they don't get enough sun. So you see the water it's not realistic. Remember, of course, the person is so it's not going to have super realistic or sharp modeling or simulated texture. All the uh, sorry textures are implied, not simulated. But it almost feels like it's super realistic because of the way he portrays the difference in the light hitting the water uh, where there are no lilies and then the light hitting the lilies where the flowers are blossoming, you see, above the pads, of course, as well as on the bridge and on the weeping willow and the other trees. It's, it's a masterpiece. And this, this one, I think, 
there was an insurance of 100 million for it by the museum. I read something about it recently. In the last several years, it was insured because there have been some high profile art thefts from museums, you know, in the last 10 years. A few of them got away with some very valuable paintings. Okay, so, but this one's probably pretty safe. <clears throat> Uh, we hope. <laughs> okay, so that's really the main, you know, it was a series, he painted the same exact scene with the same bridge and the same pond. Mold, just say dozens, it was dozens of times. Sometimes he'd get up closer in the composition, I mean, might be just this section, you know, here in the middle, you know, between the, the uh, top or arch of the bridge and, and just the water itself. But here, of course, he's painting a much more wider perspective. All right, formal analysis. Balance totally, completely balanced with the bridge across the middle. That's certainly how it's. And then of course you do see from left to right, it's true this weeping willow is more visible, but there are trees here too. That's not empty sky. So it's balanced both ways. The rhythm is obvious with the repeated shapes of the water lilies and uh, the, the footbridge, the railings. The colors is an interesting combination of cool and warm. It's mostly cool on the bottom half, including the bridge, of course, blues and greens, but it's warm on the flowers and then the trees, the sun's hitting part of them, right? So you see kind of a light, almost yellowish green where the sun hits the willow trees and the bushes too. So it's a mixture of warm and cool, but more cool than warm. Uh, it is dynamic only on the footbridge. I mean, everything else is pretty much right? Uh, not right angles, but straight, arranged in straight lines. Even the tree, the branches are hanging straight downward as a willow would do. And even on the bridge itself, though the bridge railings are dynamic, the, I'm sorry, I meant the, the top of it, but the uh, side railings, those are uh, stable. So it's more stable than dynamic. Uh, for here, you've got scientific perspective, overlapping, diminishing size, I don't really see foreshortening, unless you want to say the pond itself, and then you could make that case. Uh, I guess there is that one aspect of foreshortening, and, and this has atmospheric perspective in the, in the distant trees. And there's a vanishing point, no question of that. He, he often talked about that. He, he would sometimes abandon that, but he preferred it for his landscapes. Okay, and then we have, um, let's see, the rhythm is obvious, right, with the trees. Uh, oh, the largest mass, I'd say it's the pond itself, and then the bridge and then the willow tree. And there is no line, remember that. And the modeling is all soft and diffused. Now this artist is also important. One of his last two slides is going to be um, on, on the final. So I'm gonna tell you which of these two, the last two more, we're still getting quite early. You notice that it's only 902, but we do have two more must knows and uh, I think you want to take good notes on both. But of these two, the kiss is the one you should study the most carefully because I'm not cutting that from their list. But this is equally famous. So here we are, the last artist of the night, Rodin, R O D I N, or Rodin, as they say in France, they pronounce it that way. R O D I N, last name. Of course, the thinker, you've probably all seen this, 1889. Rodin is considered the greatest sculpture, sculptor, okay, we'll have to say Western art. You really have to qualify that. The greatest sculptor in Western art between, um, many would say between Michelangelo and the 20th century, but at least you would have to say of the uh, last 200 years, he's considered one of the greatest and certainly the greatest sculptor, most famous, successful, influential, innovative, all those things you could say about him, of any sculptor anywhere in Europe, we're saying, remember the person, sculptor, T-O-R, um, of his era. There's no question. He lived to be about 80 some years old. So why so? Why do we say that about him? Well, first he had two signature motifs and they're both visible. He would depict human bodies with what he called malleable lumps of clay. You know, of course, that any bronze sculpture, his favorite medium was bronze. Um, would have started out as a clay model, of course. So what you see here, if you look closely, is this strange looking lump effect that is visible, especially, it almost looks like he was in some kind of car accident or something, as one of my students said. Uh, and it's also true on his hair, right? And on his back, his rib cage, uh, and to a lesser degree, his arm. So this malleable, you know, malleable, the word, don't worry how to spell it, 
he can make them, you know, with clay and then cast them in bronze. Malleable lumps of clay, that's a quote from him, was one of his signature motifs, meaning his figures had a rough, unfinished look. And that wasn't considered a good Renaissance realistic technique. Of course, he was abandoning strict Renaissance realism with that. And his other signature motif was a um, rough base. All his figures have a rough base, even his marble ones. We'll see that with the last slide for tonight, the kiss. This base here is a rock that this nude thinker is sitting on. And why did he do that with all his figures? Because he was constantly reminding us, the viewer, that we're all mortal. <laughs> we're all going to go back to the earth from which we came. You know, uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. I mean, you know, it's a quote from, I guess, it's the Bible, of course. Anyway, he, he was emphasizing human mortality and that we'll all return to the earth at some point. Uh, and it's inevitable. Maybe not the most cheerful thought, but it's a fact of life, of course. And now you see this is not his original base. It's on the grounds of another gift. That's a part of the meaning. This is in the Rodin Museum courtyard. It's a museum of all his most famous sculptures, the original versions of them. This is in San Francisco. I bet a couple of you know where. In front of the Legion of Honor Museum in San Francisco is, is a copy of this by Rodin done while he was alive. That's very valuable. I'm amazed no one's tried to steal it. I'll be honest with you, although they have a pretty secure system of closing up the courtyard with those iron gates, right? So, and I assume there's 24 seven security. Anyway, it'd be kind of hard to get away. <laughs> it's pretty heavy, right? But it's really valuable because it's signed by him while he was alive. He did many copies of this. It became so popular that uh, it's become so much almost a cliche, right? So it, there isn't any deeper meaning. Oh, yeah, there is a little bit than just a man, you know, uh, sitting thinking about the meaning of life and death, right? But there is uh, one more fact about the meaning of this. It was originally intended as one of several figures for a cast iron gateway to a development. Yes, a, a, a development, you know, a neighborhood being created that never got built. The gates were never built. So each of the figures that he was paid to sculpt, he kept, including this, the thinker, and the kiss, and the last one we're going to see right after this. And so these happened to be in his studio, which was a gift, the entire estate of four acres. Now, in the middle of Paris, that is really valuable landscape, or uh, real estate, I meant to say. Um, I don't even know what kind of price you could put on that. Four acres plus a three-story chateau, again, taken away from somebody for cheating on their taxes by the French government, and then they turned around and gave it to their most famous and popular sculptor, Rodin. Okay, so what we see here is the high point of his career from that point on. Again, he never had to worry about rent. He never had to worry about, uh, you know, mortgages and and feeding himself. Uh, he just got commissions and, you know, was making a, a decent income. But he always tried to come up with some different way of depicting human figures. So let's let's uh, do the formal analysis. And then the last one has a bit of a juicy <laughs> kind of uh, hidden meaning to it. We'll, we'll talk about it when we finish up. All right. So what do we have? We have two objects here. This is not part of the original sculpture. And obviously the largest mass is the, the, the human figure, the thinker, and then the base. Uh, the texture is implied here. I mean, this is not smooth, normal human skin texture or normal hair. I call that macaroni hair. It almost looks like a bowl of pasta was slapped over his skull there. I mean, it's not meant to look super realistic, but it's implied. So many people call him an impressionist sculptor. That's an odd concept that, that's usually limited to painting. But in a way, he was the first. Now, others imitate him, so you just say the first impressionist sculptor because he used these impressionistic techniques in his figures such as the implied simulated texture of course the modeling is from the shadows of the sun there is carved line here it's it, it's not that visible on the face uh this is remember not part of this don't don't write about this if it's on the exam just everything above the base or above the pedestal it's that's a pedestal there's the base so there was carved line it's more visible on his legs here right and then um, it's balanced. It's an attack human figure, of course. It's got all the parts. It's got the rhythm, of course, of the legs, hands, arms, feet, and of course, in the face. And it's a cool color, kind of a uh, 
dark blue color of bronze. The bronze can often be, or even dark greenish blue. And here's what happens when bronze gets out in the, uh, the weather in this rain for enough years. This is not a must know. The must know is coming up, the very last one. This is a portrait of a famous French writer, Balzac. <laughs> My daughter was just playing while we had our break uh, with the games, categories. Some of you may have played it, yeah. And a French writers was one of the categories and the letter was B. <laughs> so she knew about it. So this guy was really a famous French playwright, novelist, um, poet. And so his widow, after he died, uh, commissioned this piece. And uh, for some reason, the French government wouldn't put it up in whatever building they were going to put on it. They didn't like it, but she did. So she just told him to keep it. So here it is in the grounds of his estate. And then here's one of his more famous ones, the burgers, not as in the sandwich, but the, you know, the town council, basically, of Calais. It's a scene from the Black Death during the bubonic plague when they shut the gates to any of their own fellow citizens who were begging to be let back in if they traveled and they might have caught the plague. They, they understood that much about pandemics back then, though they never used that word, that it was contagious. So they, they had this, listen to the pitiable, pitiable, there we go, pitiable cries and, and begging of their fellow citizens outside the city walls. Uh, and they had to have the courage to be willing to accept the responsibility for that act. So it shows all of them in the moral agony here, debating whether they should have opened the gates or maybe should go back and reopen. Okay, but here we go, our last must know and really important slide. Okay, this is The Kiss by Rodin. Again, it's R-O-D-I-N, just like it says, The Kiss, 1898. Okay, there are two levels of meaning for this. And the first level is that it is a scene from Dante, you know, the Italian poet, D-A-N-T-E is how you spell his name, but you just write it how it sounds. Dante wrote a poem about hell called The Inferno. It's called Dante's Inferno. Today, it's still being quoted in, you know, plays, books, movies. So it's a, it's a depiction of, of what happens to people who are sinners after they die, what part of hell they go to. So this is a scene from Dante's Inferno in which two adulterous lovers, you don't have to know their names, but if you want to know, they're in that, that uh, poem. Paolo, the man, and Francesca, the woman, don't ask me to spell them. Well, I will. P-A-O-L-O -O is the man, and Francesca, you probably all know, F-R-A-N-C-E-S-C-A. -E they were adulterous lovers, both married to someone else, and they committed adultery, and that's why they went to hell. So it shows them in the embrace at the moment of, you know, passion when they first, you know, broke that commandment, right, and became adulterous lovers. But it has a different meaning, an additional level, I should say, of meaning. Whoops, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't mean to do that. That's too far forward. Let's look at his thumb. There's something strange going on here. He's in the middle of a passionate kiss. And of course, thinking about what comes next. But look what's happened with his thumb. You notice, anybody? Well, I know everyone's too tired to comment. That's not typical. The thumb is raised, and that clearly is a sing signal, there we go, of reluctance or hesitance, supposed reluctance or hesitance on the part of the man in this couple. When in the reality, as one of my students said on a field trip to see the copy of this, there is a copy of this too at the museum in San Francisco, the Legion of Honor, it's a smaller version. She said, I don't know why any, you know, man who's gone this far would be hesitant, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense, except unless you know it's a self mea culpa. Self-portrait is too strong a word. There's no way Rodan looked like this guy. He was much older by the time he, he sculpted this. But it is a kind of confession, and this is a major part of the meaning, about his own misbehavior with one of his protégés. Uh, an assistant in his studio who was 20 when he met her, he was 55. And they had an affair that lasted 15 years. She resisted him for months. And of course, today he would rightfully be probably tried for that. <laughs> but this was France in the 1800s. So that went on for years. I think it was 15. Yeah, I just say many years, well over a decade. 
And he finally broke it off because yes, he was married. <laughs> so he's saying, yes, I behave just as badly as the man in this sculpture, but at least I was a little reluctant, which isn't even true at all. He's the one who pursued her, not the other way around. So it isn't even an honest mea culpa. <laughs> it's a dishonest one. But people that knew him and knew the history of that uh, illicit relationship would have known about that. And they would have known that he was trying to say, well, you know, I at least had some qualm, some conscious. Yeah, well, then you do what you do and you don't do what you don't do. So he was trying to excuse his bad behavior. It's another way of putting it. Formal analysis, it's at the Rodin Museum. It's in the uh, living room. And it was his favorite sculpture of all the ones that he designed. Well, not, it was his favorite marble piece, let's put it that way. He did many pieces in marble, but more so in coarse bronze, as I said. So this is marble and it has that rough base, but here the bodies are smooth and realistic. You're not gonna be able to do malleable lumps of clay with, of course, stone, let alone smooth marble. So there's a realistic symmetric texture on their bodies and the skin and the hair. And that's done with carved line and of course, smoothing off the surface. Uh, and the two figures, the largest mass is the man, then the woman, then the base. It's balanced. Yeah, they'd have to be to be sitting like this. And of course, full of the rhythm, the human body parts. And it's both dynamic on uh, her more so than him, right? Actually, he's almost entirely stable. And the base is more stable than dynamic. Uh, but taken together, it's a mixture of the two. Here, it's two life-size adult human figures overlapping each other and the base. The modeling is a part of the concept of the composition. He chose to cite this exactly in the spot in the living room. He wanted the light to hit just like this so that it would emphasize his raised thumb or Francesco, uh, sorry, Paolo's, uh, and, and also show the contours of their body. So he positioned it right near one of the main windows in that chateau that was a gift from the French government. There's, there's no accident. It's not just the uh, you know, uh, you know. let's say accidental rays of the sun hitting it at a certain time. He knew when the light would hit it and what time of day it would look best. So he positioned it here uh, by, by his careful calculation for the maximum effect of the modeling. Um, and let's see, uh, balance, rhythm. Oh, the colors, cool, all white. I'm gonna end with one last thing here. Any of you ever heard of Andrew McCarthy, a pretty famous actor? Uh, they used to be part of what they called the, with a B, Brat Pack of people that did movies like Sixteen Candles and, uh, oh gosh, what was it? There, there, there were a bunch of movies and, oh yeah, um, St. Elmo's Fire. He, he was just a pretty face to me. I never, thought, I met him in Paris at this museum, but here's the reason why I'm mentioning this, because it's like a two minute anecdote. I saw him by chance three times in three days at three different museums. First, he was waiting in line at the Musée d'Orsay, the one we talked about earlier today, which is their new museum of impressionism. He was incognito, he thought, I recognized him. He had um, a trench coat on, dark glasses, a hat, and a five day growth of beard. And he was with his then Italian model girlfriend, the two of them were going through the museums of Paris. Then I saw him inside the Louvre the next day. I didn't say a word to him. The third time I saw him coming out of this museum, I had to say something. And of course he thought it was a um, autograph seeker. Well, no, I wasn't. He wasn't one of my favorite actors. And that's not why I stopped him. He said, oh, you caught me. Yeah, I guess you know who I am. Okay, where do you want me to sign your article? I said, no, no, I, I don't. I'm not interested in your autograph. I teach art history at a college in, in California. I'm just wondering, I've seen you at three different museums and they're very different, all three of them, you know, in, in the last few days, which one was your favorite? This is a scene of Adam and Eve, by the way. Isn't this wonderful? It's a miniature, Adam and Eve. Obviously, Eve is the woman with full, fully formed, intelligent features. And Adam is the, the lunk of clay with his head stuck in the mud. And then here's the last uh, slide for tonight. That's her, his uh, lover that he uh, pursued for a whole year and finally uh, maneuvered into an affair, the one I just told you about. Her name was Camille Claudel. She became a famous sculptor on her own, by the way, quite successful. Um, but she never got over him or married anyone uh, after that. So here he is showing that he was the pursuer. He's being honest. These are miniatures in uh, in glass cases. So I ask, uh, just to wrap it up here, I ask <laughs> uh, Andrew, his name is McCarthy, um, which was your favorite museum? He didn't hesitate. He said, oh, this one. I said, well, it's surprising. I wouldn't have thought you'd mention the sculpture museum when you were at the Louvre. He goes, oh, I said, do you mind asking why? Uh, and he said, yeah, that's easy. I saw you upstairs looking at those rather interesting, you know, miniature figures. 
And I just have to say, I until I saw this museum, I never realized that stone could be so erotic. So I asked him for permission to quote him, and he said yes. Okay, you don't have to write any of that, obviously. Okay, now we come to the end. So does anybody want me to restate the definition of Impressionism if you weren't here the first 10 minutes? Because it's in the video, of course, that we'll see when I post it uh, Friday night. But anybody need me to do that or have any other questions again about your papers? Don't forget they're due one week from today. If you want to turn them in early, if you give me more than 48 hours advance, I can give you feedback as to whether you're missing anything or need to add something. Um, and you don't want points off, you need to have them in by midnight next, and that will be the 27th, uh, right? Uh, next uh, Tuesday. Any questions about papers, extra credit, grades, or anything else from anybody? Uh, okay. Well, I hope if you missed the first part, I know we had two or three people join us late. You will, this is an important one, the whole thing of impressionism. Join, join, sorry. <laughs> go to YouTube and look them up after 8 p.m. That's to be safe. I usually post them by seven, but it takes a while for them to process. So after 8 p.m. on Friday, you can you can watch anything you missed uh, or review it, of course, before the final, because there's a good chance that maybe two of the slides we showed tonight will be on the final. All right, that's it. Last call, any questions from anybody? All right, good night, you guys. <laughs> Take care. Have a good week. <laughs>